Greetings, flesh creatures. It is I, Megatron. On behalf of TFYLP, I want to congratulate you for listening to the most refined collector podcast on this miserable little planet Earth. Yes. Here you'll find knowledgeable fans discussing every aspect of Transformers and beyond. Now, enjoy the show while I continue my path to complete conquest of all of you miserable biological entities. Predacons! Terrorize! Hi, welcome to TFYLP. We have a special episode today. Uh, we're here with a special guest, um, Ben Yi. Um, so thank you, Ben, for uh, joining us today. So um, we're also here with uh, uh, Peter and Paul and Christian. Well, Ben, thank you for joining us. I know, um, you know, just to introduce you, I know you are a Transformers, um, I guess, hard to say, I guess, blogger, I guess. I don't know what's the best word. Uh, That's fine. Media, That's fine. media personality kind of thing. Uh, Big fan. Interviewer, <laughs> fan. Big Transformers fan. <laughs> that covers it. Transformers fan. So, yeah, thank you for joining us. I know that we've uh, all been reading your work for... A very long time. I know you've been on the show, uh, TFLP, a few years ago as well, but I uh, appreciate having you back here. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And I know uh, now is kind of a perfect time uh, because there's just so many things going on with the Transformers brand uh, that, you know, we're kind of getting restarted. We have a new movie coming out here uh, shortly. We've, you know, going hot and heavy with a lot of the, you know, legacy branding. Uh, we have video games. We have cartoons. I mean, it just, just seems like it's, it's kind of crazy with the amount of Transformers we have going on these days. It's a lot to keep track of. Yeah, I, I, um, I think, you know, I, I was thinking the other day when I was talking to some friends online that um, I, I said something like, Oh, you know, we're we're kind of in this golden age, right? But I thought about it, and if you kind of go back a decade, two decades, we've kind of been in one golden age after another, right? Um, we've really been lucky ever since the brand basically survived cancellation in the U.S. and survived fading out in other countries, right? Uh, back in the late '80s, early '90s, um, when when Transformers kind of hung on life support with G2, and then of course got a Nice big boost with uh, the Beast Generation and then just kind of has just been on an upswing ever since. Uh, it just really occurred to me how lucky we are as fans to have this. I mean, the other fandom I look at that I always say, well, we could be them is G.I. Joe. Um, imagine being a hardcore Joe fan while you're watching Transformers like rise up and come back to life and everything going, well, what about us? And then you get maybe some reissues a few times every few years. Maybe you get three inch figures. You kind of want six inch figures, but that's 20 years in the future. <laughs> you know, I, it, there are so many places where Transformers could have been worse off over the years. And where we are, I think, is a place most fandoms would envy. I think mm, uh, the only other fandoms I can think of that probably have something comparative to us, Marvel, uh star wars and turtles i think that's about it i think everybody else except maybe joan now with classified has kind of been wanting for a very long time and meanwhile here we are going hey look we got a g-axis figure based on the g2 figure finally <laughs> right um and beast wars just got a big comeback in kingdom and still continuing in legacy some of the best figures they've ever put out and you know of course for the younger fans you have a whole new animated series on paramount plus which is a major network and some cute toys to boot so i, I mean what more could we ask for i mean i could ask for a lot but you know as a fandom I think it's important sometimes to take a step back and take a breath and look at what we have and go, holy cow, that's amazing that we have that because not everyone does. Right. We can always complain about like, oh, I wish we had this. I wish we had that. But yeah, we're, we're very lucky. I mean, I think Transformers is one of those brands that really is a worldwide brand uh, comparative to, 
you know, others like you mentioned, Joe, I, I don't know that that still, you know, kind of had the support over in, you know, Europe and Asia the same way it does over here. And then, you know, there's a lot of other brands that, that are bigger over in, in the Asia region. Uh, so Transformers, I feel like, is one of those ones where it's, it seems like it's equally popular worldwide. Yeah, um, maybe Power Rangers also could be folded in there. Um, I could give it that, although I, I don't know the relative popularity in Europe for Power Rangers. Uh, but overall, we are in a great position now, not only because, okay, we have you know the cartoon and we have different lines and everything, but also we are in an era where we literally say things online and Hasbro's listening. And Hasbro picks up on those things. Oh, hey, they, they seem to like this needle nose guy. <laughs> Why don't we make a new toy of him? And then the toys come out, and then you've got designers posting on Instagram with behind the scenes concept drawings and renders and things like that. This is stuff that 20 years ago we couldn't have imagined. And maybe we only got a glimpse at when we attended the BotCon panel for Hasbro. And then when they did that whole Energon thing where you put the codes in, every now and then we got some concept art out of that, right? But how, right, how, when in history did we get this regular influx of back and forth push and pull between Hasbro and the fandom? And that happens now. And through the, uh, even though we, as we were discussing earlier, they don't have the fan media day right now with Toy Fair, what they do still have are these fan media roundtables that they hold every now and then and different sites and podcasts and so on are invited to those. Guess what? On those Hasbro gets quite the earful. <laughs> um, they, I don't think they actually put out the entire recording of that. I think that's more, they depend on the sites to report back, but in between a lot of the questions that the different sites and venues are asking, there's a lot of, Hey, you know what you guys should do? Or here's our opinion of this. Or every once in a blue moon, they'll say to us, well, okay, hey, what do you guys think about this? Because we saw a discussion on this online. What does that, you know, where do you guys see that? Example, mm -hmm. translucent plastic, good or bad, right? And I'm on the fence of it. I think it, it's good if you're just using it for light piping or a panel on the chest that is not involved in the transformation, fine. But the moment there's a hinge attached to it, you're scaring the heck out of me, right? But they've been doing that a lot. And collectively, a whole bunch of us on this call, one of the fan media days from last year, we all collectively said, stop using clear plastic on hinges. Because it some in some cases, it's breaking right out of the box. And in other cases, hey, five years from now, when I take that thing out of my storage and transform it again, I'm afraid that thing's just going to crack. And then I'm going to have to pay aftermarket prices to get that figure again. So... Uh, that's unprecedented, right? That this this feedback loop that we have that's constant because of social media and events like that. So that's another way I think things have really changed between now and say the Armada era. So what is the response to that type of feedback when you say, "Hey, uh, you know, Studio Series Jazz, that's like half of them is made of translucent plastic, you know, with paint over the top." you know, I'm concerned about this breaking. What do, do they say? Oh, we've tested it. Blah, blah, like what, what is the response? To that? Um, generally it's a, actually, there's a lot of note taking. <laughs> they do actually write uh -huh. stuff down. I've seen them do that several times when we say these things. Uh, but they'll also sometimes say, oh yeah, we, we kind of figured that out. And in the future we're incorporating some of that feedback. So example, uh, if you look at, uh, the buzzworthy cup and cliff jumper, right. Mm -hmm. They didn't feature, I think as much or any translucent plastic compared to the figures they were based on, right? They had panels, plastic panels that were then painted with the details. Um, that was one example they gave. They said, and Buzzworthy had uh, Cliff Jumper and Cup had not yet come out when we had that fan media day. So they actually said, oh, you know, with Buzzworthy, Cup and Cliff Jumper, we listened to that and you're going to see that reflected in that. Now, doesn't mean they always get it because they're still releasing figures with translucent parts that are on hinges. Right. But, uh, but it's also important to keep in mind that um, on these events, they'll have one or two designers. They are not, not a monolith. You'll have one designer like Mark working on X figures. Sam works on different figures. Then you have the guys in Japan working on different figures. So sometimes, even if Sam and Mark take what we say to heart, 
it may not necessarily translate to someone else on the team who's already submitted his design. Uh, but the whole idea is to keep that message going, keep that feedback coming in a positive way, in a professional way, so that it kind of gets stuck in their brain. And when they're designing figures in the future, they'll think, oh, wait, maybe I shouldn't use the translucent here. What would make more sense here? You know, and, and hope that it's not always going to work. We're all human. Right. Um, but it works more often than not. There's a lot of stuff that's on shelf now. And I have to be careful how I phrase this that I can tell you is a direct result of fan feedback. Well, I'm curious, you know, one of, one of the issues that they've had uh, recently is with yellowing plastic. And have they given a response to you guys about that? Like, you know, what like, do they happen to know what the issue is uh, with that and, uh, you know, why it's happening? They do. It's a factory issue. They did address that on the same fan media day. It is a factory issue. There was a plastic mix that was incorrect. Uh, just chemically, something was done wrong. And that's why. Um, and unfortunately, batches of figures did make it out before they realized it. Um, you know, a lot's been made in the last few years about QC, and I'm on board with that. I think <sighs> missing parts, you know, having two right forearms, you know, stuff like that just really shouldn't happen with these figures. But I, I think that stuff you can test for in QC to a degree. But unfortunately, yellowing is not something you could really test for because I don't think they like grab a bunch of figures, leave them in the sun for two weeks and then <laughs> go back and look at them. I don't think that happens. Um, but I will tell you what was fantastic about that particular discussion. The fans should really take the heart is Hasbro saw all those pictures people were taking of before and after or the yellowing bits. Right. Uh, as an aggregate across all social media, Facebook, Twitter, IG, whatever. And by the time I had had a discussion with them about it, they said, oh, yeah, we've got all these pictures and we know and we're already checking with the factory and asking them what happened there, guys. And then by the time the fan media day happened, they had an answer for us. Now, will it ever happen again in the future? I don't know, maybe, because the thing is, uh, and, and this could be a perception thing on my part. My perception is that back in the days when they were using the factories in China, we had a lot less of these types of issues, right? The QC issues weren't quite as rampant. And I feel like the factories in Vietnam, even though they've been doing this for the better part of a decade now, uh, they still have a lot to learn. They still have a lot to figure out. And I can't guarantee, even, and they can't guarantee that everything will be perfect because Hasbro goes to the factory of Vietnam and says, here are the specs. Here's what we want you to do. It's up to that factory to actually do it right. And then it's up to the QC people to actually catch it. Those people might not necessarily be at Hasbro. <laughs> they could be in the factory. And then the factory guy says, it's all good. And what's factory, what's Hasbro going to do? They're going to say, all right, we're paying you. We'll take your word for it. You're contractually obligated to do the right thing. Doesn't mean they always are. Uh, but you know what? I think a huge, um, credit should go to Hasbro because uh, I think it, it made its way online, uh, the news that they're going to be doing a small batch of uh, victory savers, right? And why are they manufacturing another batch? Because they're not supposed to do that with Haslab. That batch is being manufactured strictly for returns and exchanges. And they didn't have to do that. They could have just said, so sorry, live with it, or Pulse will send you a check or something, right? Whatever their normal operations say. But this time out, they said, this is a special item. So we know we have to give it special treatment and they're giving it that run. Now, it's going to be a few months until you, you can get that exchange. But kudos to them for even doing that and acknowledging what went wrong. I want to get a check from Hasbro Pulse. That sounds <laughs> awesome. It takes about six to eight weeks. <laughs> Direct deposit. There you go. But, uh, yeah, no, that's the thing that's really, you know, tricky with those types of scenarios. And I know, um, you know, Masterpiece is another one that kind of runs into that similar uh, thing where, you know, there, there are issues with some of the Masterpiece figures or with paint chipping or scratching or just whatever QC, you know, when you produce thousands of these figures out of the box, uh, that there are going to be some of those types of issues. And... Um, yeah, so it's 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 good that they are able to actually uh, you know process some returns and to uh, you know fix some of the people's issues. So. Well, MP Hound was heartbreaking. 
right? I mean, it, it, wonderful looking design, look great in both modes. And I have a friend who's a devout Masterpiece loyalist. Like that's his main Transformers collection is Masterpiece. And he loves them to death. And he took that one out and he said, yep, broke on my first transformation. Um, Apologies, but I was a little bit out of the loop on the Masterpiece Hound. What was the... What uh, was the during Transformation, I think there's a hinge joint specifically. I forget exactly where it is. And it just snapped. And this happened on a lot of people's hounds. Um, I think if this was the old days when MPs cost like 45 to 55 bucks, it'd be one thing. But we're in an era where they frequently cost well over $120. And once you get to the triple digit area, I really think there needs to be an extra level of attention paid to that, especially if you're going to call it something like Masterpiece, right? Um, and unfortunately, again, they're not always going to nail it. And that was an example where they did it. I am actually happy, though, to see that Masterpiece with the skids mold is kind of reversing course a bit and kind of going back to the older philosophy of Masterpiece design, where it's a little simpler. We're not going to go bonkers on everything and create 50 panels to move just so it looks like the cartoon. It's like, you know what? We're going to get it partway between the two, which is what Masterpiece originally was. And we're going to do a licensed vehicle and enjoy, you know? And I'm really happy about that because as beautiful as, say, Masterpiece Sunstreaker was, I spent 45 minutes transforming that thing with a YouTube video helping me. And I said, I'm not having fun here. Other people do. Other people love that aspect. Like they spend 45 to 60 minutes on a transformation and it's great. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> if I can't get the thing transformed within 25 to 30 minutes, I'm probably going to wander off and go do something else. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of a tricky proposition these days too, because um, you know, the, the main line has really stepped up their quality and the parts count and the articulation and all that type of thing. And so I do wonder, you know, what logistics that Takara goes through to say, you know, do we want to produce a figure that is at, you know, that lower price point that may be a little simpler or like, is that going to start getting into, you know, uh, the, the market of some of those other figures and some people are going to say oh well you know what i'm just going to get the 20 dollar like you know we all agree that the hundred dollar figure is better but you know is it enough to to spend a hundred dollars whereas if they produce a hundred and fifty dollar two hundred dollar figure that you know has is beautiful immaculate with paint and all the bells and whistles is that you know what people are really looking for and I, i'm sure that that is a hard thing for them to try to uh determine like exactly what the fans want and what's going to sell the most well we have a perfect example of that coming out soon right so with siege we got an amazing commander class jet fire figure uh to me that's one of the best figures they've ever put out like hands down it's fun it looks great it's big uh it has a lot of features right and uh, and it, it kind of nods and winks to the Robotech origins or, or the Macross origins, but it doesn't cross that line. So Harmony Gold can't sue anyone again. <laughs> and, um, um, but they, I think when they showed me that thing at Toy Fair, I think I loved everything. Like John, I remember John Warden showing me the whole fist switching thing. But the moment that I fell in love with the toy was when he said, now watch this. He picks it up in jet mode and he swings out the handles and he attaches figures and they're hanging on. And I'm like, that's insane. You did not have to do that. And it's purely there for play value. And I love it. Right. And people bought it. I mean, that figure sold. It sold through two production runs, which speaks to how great it was. Now, here we are a few years later and we've got the masterpiece uh, Skyfire coming out, which is a beautiful piece but objectively does not do as much as the siege figure it literally just doesn't have as many features it looks amazing it looks like the cartoon model jumped into plastic but the siege one kind of looked that way too so this is just like more cartoon for 80 dollars oh. more <laughs> so is, it, uh, is, is that siege figure supposed to get a, a second run here the, no which one? Sorry? Jetfire. Uh, Jetfire. Isn't Jetfire getting a new run? Yes. Yes. Because yeah. okay. it, it just sells so well, right? <laughs> Every time they do a run, it's like Omega Supreme got another run because it's just such a great figure, right? Why wouldn't you? Um, so you got another potential run coming. And then 
you have a masterpiece coming. And when they announced the masterpiece, I think the price is actually a little over two, depending on where you go. And I asked myself, I'm like, do I need this? Because <laughs> it's not singing to me the ways the Siege one did, right? It doesn't have as many features. It, the little minifigures are great. That's probably one of my favorite parts of it, the little guys, the little jazz, you know, our first actual Masterpiece jazz figure, and it's a minifigure, right? <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it, I think it's great for a very specific segment because I do have a friend who, same guy, loves Masterpiece, right? Kind of a okay with Generations if there isn't a Masterpiece guy to fill in that spot. That's kind of where he sits. He loves everything he's seen with this Masterpiece Skyfire. Does not like Siege Jetfire. <laughs> right? Weird, right? And he can't explain it to me because I said to him, I said, you know, like, objectively, like, if we just did a bullet point list, Siege Jetfire has, like, more stuff. It does more things. And he was like, no, I know that. He says, this is completely irrational. It's just his reaction is Masterpiece symbolizes a very specific segment of his collection and it symbolizes a certain status i guess of his collection it's masterpiece capital m right whereas generations is kind of like well that's kind of meant for teenagers two guys in their 40s and somehow that knocks it down a peg i guess to some people uh in terms of a standing but um i guess for me it's more about well how is it as a toy because we could call it masterpiece and say oh it's for older collectors all we want it's still a toy at the end of the day does it amuse me? <laughs> Does it? Do I have fun with it? Right. If I don't, then I'm not going to spend over two hundred dollars on it. Now, will I ever get it? If it goes on sale, I'll grab it. But I'm not pre-ordering it. Um, but that's not to say no one else should. I'm just saying that's me personally. Well, and I think the other thing that's hard is, is that uh, you also have the third party market where they've done their own version of Jetfire. Right. And so, I mean, everyone has the different collections that they have, you know, and there's some people that want to keep it, you know, only official and, and things like that. But, I mean, there are definitely um, a, a segment that have already purchased the Fans Toys figure that say, well, you know, I already spent 200 bucks or whatever that the cost of that is. Why do I care about getting the masterpiece figured uh, as well? So, I mean, that eats into sales, too. Well, that's valid. I mean, look, money is not a infinite resource, right? I mean, a lot of these collectors who spent $200, whatever, on a third party figure, they had some of them had to save up for a while to be able to afford that. So why should they, you know, go through that again? just to have the official one. And this is me as someone who doesn't collect third party saying this just from a purely financial standpoint, I completely get it. Right. Right. Well, and I think third party was one of those things too, that, you know, when they were starting the masterpiece, you know, third party kind of was supplementing your collection. Cause you know, Takara can't put out, you know, I mean, I guess they could theoretically, you know, put out, 30 masterpiece figures a year but uh the you know the thing is is that people might have been collecting those back then as a supplement and then now takara is actually getting around to some of those figures and, and i am curious and i don't know have um you know I, i'm always curious what their thoughts are you know at hasbro about third party if they're you know how where they are of it and um what you know what impact do they see uh, with third party um, overall? And I don't know if they've ever said anything officially with that or not. Um, it was discussed at one of the toy fairs uh, I went to on the floor. Uh, John Warden was showing me the uh, Titan class Devastator. Um, and I asked him about influences from third party on the decision to make a Titan class devastator. And he said, yeah, he, and, and, and he admitted that they've gotten a couple of them in the office because they kind of wanted to see what this pseudo competition was doing. Right. Uh, they wanted to understand the engineering. They wanted to see strengths, weaknesses and so on. So there's definitely an awareness of it. Um, I do think, however, that, I mean, think about it. That was Titan class devastator. So that was many years ago. Right. right. Um, we are, in a different place now with third party. The funny part is I don't collect it, but so many people post about it on Facebook. I can't get away from it. Um, third party as a market has shrunken a lot. And I don't think Hasbro sees it as much of a threat now 
as they would have six, seven years ago when they were very prolific. Um, the funny part is, you know, a lot of people think I'm like just anti third party. Well, that's a nuanced discussion, but uh, third party could have been like used what they were doing back then, like creating five Menasaurs a year uh, and six Devastators a year and 17 Jetfires a year. Like that's all they seem to be doing. And unfortunately, they cannibalized themselves. And the sad part is I think there was an opportunity for third party to do some really interesting original stuff. Um, I forget. I think it's Fans Toys made this uh, original construction machine that was only sold at a convention. I think Big Bad has it. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it, it was this beautiful, beautiful toy, not based on any Transformers IP. It's their own original design, very complex looking like by Transformer standards, it'd be like a leader class price point nowadays, uh, maybe Commander. But I said, you know, that's brilliant. That's really beautiful. It looks great. Great deco, great design, looks fun, looks complex, could sit alongside Generations or Masterpiece. Where's more of that? And then instead, five more Venosaurs came out, or six more Predakings came out. And of course, alongside of them, 10 more Superions. And I'm like, who is buying 10 Superions <laughs> in the same year? <laughs> like, no one's doing that. No one has that kind of money when each limb is $125, right? And I really wish they had just used that initial springboard where they said okay we have a, a cartoon accurate menacer cartoon accurate superior taking that money and then invested into doing some really cool original stuff now fans toys did try um one of my favorite third-party toys ever that i do own is the glacial lord figure that was a fans was project Russian. yeah a fans project sorry um and i think that was a beautiful example of taking transformers as a springboard fiction wise influence wise and then doing something really fun and original with it right and the whole marketing campaign was great with like the container ship getting lost so they had to bring in the last limb from korea or something so it had different packaging the the water damage printed on the packaging that is a stroke of creativity that i i really got excited by i was like oh is this going to start showing up in other third party stuff like this kind of influence and no one else ever took it to that level uh and i know glacial lord didn't sell out the way they wanted to i know they had other combiners planned if it had and i'm sad about that but uh there was just so much opportunity there and now if you look at what third party is announcing uh they keep announcing stuff but very few of it actually figures actually come out uh, which is what I'm noticing. Back in the day, they would rapid prototype something, paint it, put it online, and like TF Source would be selling it within six months, right? There's stuff I saw prototypes of a year ago that we've never heard about again. And I said, wow, they, you know, if that's the case, they got to be hurting, right? Because you got to tool it up, you have to run the factories and all that. It's got to be tough. Um, and I think there's a level, there's a niche they fulfill right now. But I don't think it's anywhere near what it used to be. Well, I, I think the hard thing is, is everybody wants, you know, their Optimus Primes. They want the core characters. And I'm sure even Hasbro probably recognizes that, too, that, you know, Optimus Prime sells probably much better than, you know, whatever other random, you know, Z-less character that, that may be coming out. And so, you know, because everyone doesn't have infinite money in space... And so I think that that's, I think part of the thing is, is that Hasbro's strategy is like, like they've released so much product over the last several years, just in, in general with, you know, Generations Legacy and in uh, the other lines as well, that, you know, it, it's hard for, I, I feel like third party to even say, well, what should our niche be, you know, because even if. You know, it's like they just, Hasbro, it's like just came out with this Tarn figure. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, you know, if they want to do a Tarn, you know, here, here's a Tarn, so. Well, well Hasbro will never do the DJD. <laughs> and they may not do the whole DJD, right? But they got Tarn in. Um, and, and I think they've had third party as a collective and i'm i am kind of being a little unfair because it's it's disparate groups right it's like kind of subgroups under the header of third party but as a group as a large body we'll call it third party they've had over half a decade to figure that niche out 
and they kept going back to the same well over and over again. Hasbro can do that with Optimus Prime and Bumblebee and so on. Third party cannot. What's the big difference there? Because the third party market is hardcore fans, usually 40 plus years old, maybe mid 30s plus, right? With a specific level of income. So that's a very specific market you're hitting. Meanwhile, Hasbro's like, hey kids, we're putting out an Optimus Prime. It transforms literally by falling on its face. <laughs> and you know what? A bunch of six and seven year olds eat that thing up. Thus money is made. I mean, yeah, there you go. Right there, right there. <laughs> That new wheeljack they just put out for Earthspark, that thing is amazing. And it's so simple. He flops on his back and spins around and transforms, which is awesome. <laughs> you know? Um, and here's the thing. There, is, there was nothing stopping third party from going into a younger kid market. Because they had stores like Big Bad, TF Source, all these stores carrying them, right? They could have done simplified stuff for younger fans, meaning 20s, teenagers-ish, right? They could have done stuff for that, too. There's a whole market I'm shocked they never tapped, which is the Unicron Trilogy market. Because think about how old, if you were a kid, six, seven years old, watching the Unicron Trilogy, you probably have a full-time job now, making some good income, right? There you go. And you've got some spare cash. And if they had made an Armada, Starscream, Skywarp, whatever, if they had made uh you know better versions of certain characters like a demolisher but with plenty of articulation and the minicon i think there's a segment of the population that would have eaten that up but they just never went there they just kept going back to the g1 well and i i remember thinking five six years ago i said there's a lot of predikings out there like how is this sustainable because when i when i think about what hasbro does or what takara does like you were talking about earlier like if takara wanted they could put out x amount of MPs a year. I am sure that part of the calculation there over why they're not doing that anymore, they used to, but they don't anymore, is because they're also going, well, at what point are we cannibalizing ourselves, right? If we put out MP Wheeljack in the same year that Earthrise Wheeljack comes out, well, you know, we're losing somebody at some point because someone is deciding either or, right? Whereas if if you release Earthrise Wheeljack, then four years later, maybe this is not a prediction. I'm just using this as a hypothetical. If you four years later, you put out a new, you know, uh, MP Wheeljack, you're probably going to get better sales that way. And no one's feeding off of each other in that respect. And Masterpiece, uh, folks have to understand, is, a, is purely a Takara Tomy project. Hasbro will carry Masterpiece stuff, but Hasbro has very little say in what gets made there, the design process, any of that. Yep, they put a wrapper box on it, they sell it through Diamond, and then it's done. But uh, uh, put the robot name on it. Yeah, and then but Takara uh, is really dictating a lot of that. And Takara, I think most fans would agree, uh, over the last six seven years, has gotten a lot more conservative about how much stuff they put out. Which, for me, honestly, I kind of miss. Remember Legends? How great was Legends? <laughs> I, I freaking love that line. <laughs> Don't you think that has something to do with kind of the brand unity thing? Yeah, brand been? unification. Yep. yep. Like exactly. they're probably they're less excited to come to work, you know, when when they're kind of getting dictated what to do. I I think. I mean, I'm well, not saying they don't like their job. I'm just saying they they don't get to have they, they don't get any autonomy really, like they um, maybe used to. I will say this: being the company that technically owns Transformers, they could do whatever the heck they wanted. If tomorrow morning the CEO of Takara told me, woke up and said, we're doing our own subline of Transformers again. There is literally nothing Hasbro could do to stop them. They could complain up a storm, <laughs> but they could do it, right? Like Transformers go, random things like that, right? They could do that. But I think they don't because they also recognize if you kind of look at the world as a macro now, right? Um, we're not in recession, but the economists keep talking about recession. And that's a worldwide recession they're talking about, right? Um, we are coming out of a lockdown pandemic era, so the economy was dramatically affected by that. Google just laid off, what, 10,000 people? You know, we are not in the same economic standing as a world, as a planet, than we were when we were, say, seven, eight years ago, when the money was pretty free-flowing. And, you know, back then, everything cost a lot less, too. So I remember Titan's Return, right? I pick up 
misfire from Titans Return or Trigger Happy or one of those guys in the U.S. Okay, he's twelve ninety nine, whatever, thirteen ninety nine. Uh, oh, the Takara version has a nicer deco and comes with an articulated Target Master and a comic book. Forty bucks? Sure. <laughs> I mean, that was that was a no brainer, <laughs> you know. Um, but now, guarantee you, if they did the same thing, that thing would be like fifty five dollars minimum. <laughs> and that's before the retailer markup, right? Uh, we are not in a world where we can sustain that. Uh, and there's a larger conversation going on right now in the action figure community, and, and all you guys have probably seen the same videos I have, about pricing. Uh, um, not just Hasbro, but everyone across the board. Mattel, you know, doesn't matter who. Everyone bumped their prices up during the pandemic, ostensibly because of cost increases, right? Shipping, oil, right? Okay, fair enough. But then they kept doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and those costs have gone down since, right? And I am usually the first person to cheerlead, especially for Hasbro, and say, you know what? They had to make up for it. So in 2020, 2021, when they raised prices, I was like, no, I get it. You know, shipping's insane right now. Cost of manufacturing's insane. Totally get it. But then in 2022, when it kept going up, but the price of oil actually went down per barrel, the price of manufacturing leveled off, I said, oh, this is... The next phase, and it's not just Hasbro. I mean, how much do your eggs cost right now, right? Um, everything has been bumped up because the company said, oh, I think we could just do this, and the consumers will just eat it. And we did for a while because we didn't know any better. But now consumers are pushing back. And, and I, I heard an economic report on this um, recently. And and they just – consumers are starting to buy less because they're like, well, if you're going to charge more, I'm just not going to buy as much as I used to. The same is starting to happen with toys. Um, what's the phrase that's going on right now? The Boba Fett tax <laughs> among Star Wars figures uh, fans where it's like, oh, this figure is thirty dollars. And then suddenly because it's Boba Fett, it's thirty five. Right. And on their on their pulse stream, uh, Hasbro basically said, well, it's because Boba Fett has a higher parts count. He's got more paint taps, which is possible, except. You've amortized that tooling like a hundred times over already. Like that cost you spent on the tooling, even if you're shoring that tooling up, you paid for that years ago. And it like your variations, some of them have less deco than the main one, right? Like the animated one, as far as I could tell, maybe I'm wrong. Someone call me out on it if I am. The animated one, the ones from droids, I have that figure. It doesn't seem to have as many deco points as the one um that's supposed to represent him from the movies but you're still charging me 35 bucks for the thing <laughs> right um i used to be this this was my collecting landscape once upon a time so um transformers number one star wars black series uh and marvel legends kind of trailing way behind and then like occasional weird stuff here and there um and i will tell you last year i bought two Marvel Legends and one Star Wars Black Series. And part of the reason for that was because of the price increases. I just, I could not pay for all my Transformers pre-orders, which had also gone up in price, right? Um, and still afford those other toys as well. So there is, uh, there is a consequence to a lot of the decisions that are being made. And it is, you know what, I'll acknowledge it. It is a tougher time for collectors. Like we have to be more picky. Nowadays, none of us are millionaires that I know of. <laughs> it's almost like, I don't know, it, it, we have so much available stuff now across the board, whether it's, you know, more geared toward kids or the masterpiece collector or somewhere in between where a lot of us fall. But it, it's so much harder to just because there were those people like I was one of them. I just buy everything. I'm just going to buy everything. And then ooh, now I really have to think about it, because even though there is the world to buy Ugh, I got to be a lot mm -hmm. more selective. So, because yeah, we're... to hear you say was. Uh, uh, yeah. It also I mean, to live within uh, just a few miles of uh, multiple Ross stores and, and an Oh, nice. Oh, you're lucky. Handy. My nearest Ross is two hours away. <laughs> um, well, that actually, Jim, that's that's a great point because among a lot of my friends who were once upon a time hardcore pre-order guys, right? As soon as something got announced, pre-order, pre-order, pre-order. And then we would just let it ride and wait till those pre-orders hit. Two things are starting to happen now, right? One, those pre-order dates 
aren't always accurate. So I got, and I think some of you guys probably too, got walloped during the holidays. The right? December like, drop? Yeah. Yeah. I thought, okay. well, what was that stuff? Supposed to be uh, late January, early February? So I thought, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be recovered from the holidays. And it just is like I've finished Christmas shopping. Bam. <laughs> like, what, $500 of pre-orders hit me. And I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> like, you know, why? Um, and then with some of the Legacy Evolution pre-orders, I've been very judicious about what I put on pre-order uh, because I'm afraid those drop dates aren't going to be accurate. Some Because one retailer will say, like, February, and then another. Other retail will say April for the same figure. So which is it, right? And it could be in between. Well, so I now, was say it could be depending on the retailer. One could be February. The other one could yep. be April. I mean, we've we've seen that where, you know, whatever, Target gets it, you yep. know, two months before the other ones. And then the next wave, Walmart gets it before everyone. The next one, Amazon gets it first. So it's, I, I don't know. I feel like with a lot of uh, the things we've taken for granted with, with shipping and some of the worldwide logistics that really got dis, um, you know, um, with COVID got disrupted that uh, we're, we're going to keep seeing those types of things where, you know, we can't say, Oh, it's, it's definitely going to hit, you know, here or there. And I don't even know if Hasbro knows when, when there's stuff. No, coming. They, they definitely well, don't. It's been frustrating for them as well. And, and to Jim's earlier point about raw stores, there's our other confounding part, right, is stuff going on discount, whether it's on Amazon or in Target or, you know, on limited sales, whatever. I mean, what, a month-ish after coming out, Tonkinator was on sale for half price-ish, right? I mean, that, that, that I, I paid full price for that thing, you know, and, and I mean, I got my Mint and Box one on sale, but I still paid full price for the first one because I pre-ordered it. And... The pattern we're starting to see, and I think this was addressed on the Star Wars um, stream as well, where someone asked about uh, figures being this full price and or exclusives and then suddenly appearing at Ross or Ollie's or something like that. And they kind of said, well, we don't you know, we don't really think that's going to happen as much. Now, granted, that was a Star Wars stream. But you guys know, because you guys pay attention to the same groups I do, that just this week at uh, I think it's Ross, the Walmart headmaster started appearing there for eight ninety nine a piece. <laughs> so I mean, I just went on the, check yesterday. I didn't find any of them. You know, and the Am uh, like but, Jim, you've probably seen the what the Walmart, uh, not the Walmart, the Amazon exclusives there, like the Sideswipe with the Skywarp. Right? I saw the uh, the Maximal Skywarp Sideswipe pack uh, once. Snagged it. The Skywarp was broken inside the box, like the oh. one eight hinge. Oof. Fortunately, a buddy of mine locally had one that he wasn't doing anything with, so we just kind of swapped it out. Okay. Um, and then I, I uh, like I said, went out to Ross yesterday. Uh, I got two stores within like three miles of me. And uh, I, I saw that uh, they both had a black arachnia and one of them had an air razor. See, look at that. Now, now, now Walmart, if you remember the Walmart exclusives from Legacy, the, the, the three beasts, was it the Night, Night Prowler and mm -hmm. uh, Sandstorm? And Storm. Yeah. Uh, they saturated the market. Like, like, mm -hmm. it's like, like half the deluxes were nothing but those three figures ad nauseum. Uh, for months, and I'm like, you know what? Those guys are going to get on clearance. I'm going to hold off on those. And sure enough, I just picked up Night Prowler yesterday for 17 bucks, and I was like, <laughs> oh. oh, that's cool. I'm that's cute. Mm -hmm. All right. But yeah, what, no, what have you done? You know, they, I yeah, you know need to post called. that online, Jim. You could be, yeah, you do. Because you know, really I'm still working on what to do with the arms. I, I, I haven't had the arms figured out yet. I was, I was going for kind of a Tiger Zord type thing, and then the Falcon happened. And I don't know. That's I'm still working though. on it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm so now I'm very careful about what I pre-order because the other thing is I'm worried that I'll pre-order this thing and look, two deluxes are fifty bucks now. That I mean, I can't believe I'm even saying that, but it's true. Um, and of course, the the Voyager pre-orders they just put up they're thirty five bucks a piece. That's seventy bucks right there. And I'm thinking, all right, you know, it was one thing back in the day when it was like 15 bucks a piece and it's like, ah, oh, 30, 40 bucks, I'm dropping. All right. But I think once you cross like that $50 threshold, it's getting to that point where you pause a bit, you know? I mean, look, if you're that financially secure, you got it like that and you don't have to pause, good on you. Congrats. That's not me. <laughs> I mean, we're all adults and we're, you know, careers and we have to think about our money and be very judicious about it. But like my kid collects too. 
and he wants every character and he wants, you know, he wants studio series Ironhide and, and just all the beast guys and everything. Cause he wasn't, he wasn't born when, when beast wars started. So this is like, it's like his time to shine in terms of getting those characters, getting physical representations of those characters. And when you've got $35 Voyagers and $25 deluxes and, you know, he, he, he saves his money, you know, he does chores and all that fun stuff, gets his allowance. Uh, but it's still, it, it, it's rough to watch him like, like, think about and really, you know, like struggle with, okay, I, I really want Transmetal to Megatron, but I also want, you know, for example, Crankcase and just someone else uh, breakdown, you know, and he has to really think about it. So it's, it's not just us, we're all adults, you know, but for kids that are, that are out there collecting too, it, it's, it's tricky and, and discouraging sometimes. Well, I'm sure I, I would imagine everyone here has made at least one figure sacrifice, you know, in recent months and said, you know what, I'm not going to pre-order that guy or I'm not going to grab him at full retail. I'm going to wait till later and hopefully I'll get him. And you kind of play this game of chicken <laughs> right, with pricing and availability because it's not the old days where you could walk in and there's a whole aisle of Transformers anymore. Right. So I know in my parts, I've never seen a Cosmos on shelf at walmart i got lucky i got him by a pre-order uh when like in that five minute window when he was up. but i mean i'm still looking for two because i have two friends who live in new york city where they don't have walmart and they still need him so you know maybe i mean who knows watch cases of him will show up at ollie's or something but, it might happen it might happen you know, uh, but i'm i have to kind of wait for that you know um, i saw I saw like uh, was it uh, the Friday I think it was that uh, Walmart's website uh, listed uh, Cosmos uh, as in stock again, but I I don't think it lasted all that long. They just put That's... the listing back up because of the mad. It was so maddening when they there was so much traffic hitting that listing. They just wiped it from the website back back when oh. it, it was for sale. Just like yeah. we don't want to deal with this. Like <laughs> goodbye. So I don't think anyone actually. I don't think there was actually any stock. And what's bonkers is meanwhile in the UK stores are ordering entire cases of him um there's this one facebook group i follow for transformers and this guy actually visited relatives of the uk and he just bought a case and he brought it back with him and he was like selling them off for like 45 50 bucks a piece and people got on his case about it but i was like actually if you account for pounds price and him having to bring it back he's actually basically asking cost <laughs> you know, right. with shipping <laughs> so i was like he went all the way to the uk I mean, he was visiting family, and he was just like, yeah. you know, I, I heard Cosmos was abundant here. Um, this this reminds me of a uh, this is a side story, but um, you remember the Walmart Bumblebee for War for Cybertron? That was also like pretty much just as hard to get. Um, I had one that I managed to get uh, from pre order ages ago, and that's the one I opened. But I always wanted one in box, and I've been looking for it, and the prices are just insane online, like uh, well over one hundred twenty five dollars. I've seen per, and then one day, a friend of mine was in Thailand uh, doing the touristy thing, and he just stopped into a mall and they had a toy shop. So he went to the Transformer section and took some pictures for me, and they—I'm not kidding you—they had a case of them, just solid case of just those bumblebees, just sitting there. And I and I asked him, I was, well, and the problem is the guy lives in Asia now, so it wasn't going to be any cheaper for him to buy it there and then ship it to me. So <laughs> I just said, fine, I'll wait. But I mean. It's not like the figures don't exist out there somewhere. They're out there, but it's the ch that whole supply chain thing of getting them in our hands. Well, I'm sure and then you have to add scalpers into it too, because mm -hmm. they're another factor to, to consider. I know my local area is just rotten with oh, people I'm, who. I'm in a scalper heavy zone too. I, I completely empathize. I um, uh, you know how like I think Target gets put stuff up on Tuesdays or like Monday nights or something like that. Um, if I show up right there and then I have a good shot at maybe getting something like when the first wave of Siege came out, I was there the night before it was supposed to be on shelf and I managed to get the whole deluxe wave. Lucky. But that kind of luck doesn't happen to me very often. Um, most of the time, part of the way I can tell by how picked over something is, is actually not the action figure aisle. It's the Hot Wheels aisle. Um, because that Hot Wheels section gets hit pretty hard uh, by scalpers. And and you can tell who they are. <laughs> um, there was this, I remember, this is a years ago, because I'm talking about Toys R Us US here, okay, in my area. 
many, many years ago, I went there and uh, you had to pass the Hot Wheels section to get to the action figures. So I'm passing the Hot Wheels section and I, the, the pegs were bare, which back then was an unusual thing to see. So I was like, oh, what's going on here? And it was this guy with a lady, I don't know, his girlfriend, wife, I don't know. And he had every single Hot Wheels car in his cart. And what he was doing was he was going through every single one to see if it was a rare or hard to find one. And if it was not, if it was common and he couldn't resell it, he wasn't putting it back on the pegs. He was just tossing it on the shelf on top of like the play sets and stuff. So by the time this guy was done, there was just a pile of Hot Wheels sitting on top of all the play sets. (laughs) And he wandered off with all the rare ones. And I'm like... Yeah, that's what I'm dealing with, <laughs> unfortunately. Ah, that's awful. Gotta, gotta hate those scalpers. But yeah, no, it's, I, I don't know, with online, you know, purchasing and everything, I mean, I, I, I feel like I don't even hunt as much as what I used to because it's just, it's not worth it. Um, like, unless you get a lead that like, oh, it's, you know, uh, figures are dropping at Target this week or, or whatever that you get some sightings. It's like, is it worth it to drive around town trying to find this stuff? This is why I miss BrickSeek working. Yeah. <laughs> um, in that short, what, one-year period where BrickSeek was actually accurate, it was worth it. Uh, and I will tell you one of the best BrickSeek stories was um, there was this very short period of time, like two weeks, where Siege Jetfire went down to like 40 bucks at Walmart, but not every Walmart had them, right? So I went on BrickSeek and I saw like one Walmart in like 30 minutes driving distance of me had them uh, for 40 bucks and literally just one. And I zoomed over there. <laughs> it's like It was like a cartoon. It was a puff of smoke where I was sitting. And uh, I got there and boom, it was right there on the shelf, 40 bucks. I mean, that was a score, you know? Something similar happened with uh, MPM Starscream. Uh at least 50% off. They were just trying to get rid of them. And I managed to score one of those. That's at the target that was like 15 minutes away from me. So that that was when BrickSeek was really useful. But unfortunately, they not BrickSeek, but the company's target and all of them messed all that up. I mean, heaven forbid we know where the things we want are and give them our money. <laughs> right, right. Be all too easy if that were the case. Yeah, it's, where's the challenge? <laughs> Now, what was it? Uh, was it something on the retailers? Then they they changed with their uh, their website that interfered with that working. The the way the data could be extracted, uh, they essentially blocked them uh, from being able to extract it properly, so they can't get the right inventory information anymore. Blame the Funko Pop collectors. Ah, uh, that wouldn't shock me. Um, although I will say they're. Among the collectors I don't run into very often, I'm wondering if that's just because they beat me there. I don't collect Funko, but also in Target, at least, they're in a different section. So, yeah, they're off to the side. So I, I, I just I generally don't go there. Sometimes I'll wander by that section, and there's almost nothing there that I'm interested in. So I kind of stopped. So I guess, um, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit, you know, we have a new... Uh, rise of the beast movie coming out here uh you know what what are your thoughts so far on on that uh you know we had a trailer that dropped not too long ago as well um i'm super excited uh i actually am kind of glad it didn't come out last year uh i think it kind of helped build the excitement also gave earth spark some room to breathe a little bit and get introduced to the fandom and kids let that do its thing, let it sell some toys. Rise of the Beast will probably start hitting shelves in a month or so, right, uh, if history is any indicator. But I think what's bad for the brand is when too many things start overlapping, right? So if you go to Target and you have Target exclusives on top of MPM, on top of Generations, on top of Earthspark, on top of Rescue Bots, on top of Rescue Rise of the Beasts, no one knows what to buy, <laughs> right? And, and it just looks like brand confusion at that point. And I think it's nice that, you know, some people are complaining because Earthspark is hitting shelves now, but Legacy Evo Wave, you know, one is only kind of trickling in now. I think some people are kind of mad about that. They're like, oh, well, why is Earthspark dominating? It's like, well, it kind of needs a moment, right? 
it'll fade. People are going to buy them. It'll fade into the background. It'll become like Cyberverse. Eventually, it'll be right next to Generations and then all the other stuff. Enjoy it. <laughs> you know, um, I'm of the mindset that I never complain when there's a lot of Transformers on the shelf, unless it's the same figure. <laughs> um, but um, Rise of the Beasts had me excited when they first did a press event during the pandemic, right? It was a virtual press event and they showed us images of like Nightbird and what the Terracons were gonna look like and and so on. I thought, oh, this is great. Just from the concept art, I, I said, you know what? That's fun. It's not just Autobots versus Decepticons, which is cool, but I like the idea that Transformers over the millions of years they fought segmented into subgroups, right? I like the idea that Scourge has his Terracons and they kind of were doing their own thing. And, oh, here's another group called the Predacons. And let's, we don't know much about them yet. But um, I, I never, uh, as I got older, I never really bought into the notion that every Transformer in existence was only an Autobot or a Decepticon. Um, I think this is one of the reasons uh, guys like DevCon were always kind of interesting to me because, okay, yeah, he's got an Autobot symbol on him, but he's kind of doing his own thing. You know, um, or when we got introduced to the Terracons in G1 and oddly they're working for the Quintessons, you know, that was kind of fun. Uh, they're just off over there doing their own thing. And then, of course, with Beast Wars, with Megatron and his Predacons, not only were they own, their own group, but they were a criminal group from the larger Predacon group. So I love these little segmentations of of uh, different sides in the war and showing that on the big screen is huge. Also. Kudos to them for not just saying, well, it's got to be Optimus Prime versus Megatron in every single film, right? With Bumblebee. Um, there's no Megatron here. There's no Starscream, right? It's a bunch of new guys, well, new to a live action audience. And that's great because, I mean, we have a lot of Starscream movie toys. We have a lot of Megatron movie toys. <laughs> Let's get some different characters in there. Uh, but, of course, I'm burying the lead. The, the biggest thing is bringing Maximals into it with Predacons. And I knew I was excited from the initial concept art, but when that trailer came out and you get to that shot of Cheetor running alongside Bumblebee as he's driving, I'm like, we have been waiting decades for that money shot. <laughs> uh, Kingdom almost gave it to us, but I don't, but it didn't go over the edge. You know, it got, it walked right up to the edge and it didn't go fully over. And what I want if you're going to throw vehicle transformers and beast transformers into a battle, it should be pandemonium. It should be bonkers and insane. And that's what that last part of the trailer is, where they're all charging into battle. And then you see Prime will kind of do that somersault, and he transforms mid-somersault. This is great stuff. Uh, but that, that scene blew me away. Huh? Sorry? That scene blew me away. Oh, it was amazing. You, and I then mean, he they, whips they out. had him holding the swords like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when I saw that, I was like, oh, someone's been paying attention. You know, so someone watched Beast Wars. Someone looked at art. Someone looked at the toys and said, we're going to do that. And supposedly he's got a chain weapon, too. So I want to see that. Um, but I think the biggest thing uh, that got me emotional when I first saw the Rise of the Beast trailer, aside from the visuals, uh, it's symbolic, right? It's. I remember a time when Beast Wars came out and everyone thought this was the death knell of Transformers. It was over, right? They've changed it too much. No one's going to buy these animals. You know, it's over. And look what it did. It saved the brand, right? But the problem is everything that came out afterwards kind of got more attention and it got more splashy. So like the Unicron trilogy, they marketed the bejesus out of that. I mean, coloring books, stickers, kites, <laughs> you know, name it. it. It had a product attached to it. So the Unicron trilogy got a huge push and a whole generation grew up on it. And that's great. But I don't think a lot of people realize that the Unicron trilogy, Robots in Disguise 2001, none of that would have existed if Beast Wars hadn't proven to Kenner and Hasbro that the brand was still viable. Um, and here we are decades later after you got to admit Beast Wars being ignored for quite some time, long time. Uh, yeah. IDW did some stuff with it. Uh, if you want to hear me go on a very angry rant, talk to me about how they treated the Predacons and Maximals in the main comic. Um, but 
they and then they tried to revive the title, but then they lost the license, right? So they they're not continuing. So it kind of petered out. So here we are now. Boom! Live live action, big budget, hundreds of millions of dollars representation of the thing that saved the brand. Um, I I I can't say how happy that makes me. Well, and the thing that's nice now too is is it in this era it seems like in instead of trying to completely reinvent things like what Michael Bay did with the original Transformers movie that they are paying homage, you know, both to the G1 figures and to the um, you know, Maximals and, and Terracons and Predacons and, and such. So, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's more in the ballpark than what they were doing, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I think there was this brief period of time in 2007 to 2010, 2011-ish, between the original live-action movie and Dark of the Moon, where the whole, like, crazy, jagged metal thing, which Megatron exemplified, um, I think it worked. Because to the public, it changed their mental paradigm of what a Transformer is, right? Or what a Transformer could be, because it was so radically different than what they grew up with. Uh, it wasn't boxy, you know, there weren't a lot of angles. It was a lot of jagged edges and stuff like that. Um, but I think over time, as with so many things in fashion or, or, or aesthetics, people kind of got over it. I think people, it became part of their mental paradigm. So they were like, well, what's new about that? Right. Um, and I think people also got more nostalgic and said, well, you know, when I was a kid, they kind of looked like this. And I think Bumblebee did this wonderful job when they introduced, you know, Shatter and, and, and other models in the beginning Cybertron sequence of saying, OK, we're going to take a little from column A and a little from column B and we're going to mash them up. and We're going to give them a little bit of that nostalgia that they're really into. And it worked. I mean, that opening Cybertron battle scene, I think, is some of the best Transformers moments ever caught on film. <laughs> and, uh, and I think uh, the way the battles played out in the film, like where they use transformation as part of their battling, is also huge. Um, and I think they got it, and I think they understood, because they monitor social media, they know people responded positively to that. And it seems to me that with Rise of the Beast, they're kind of leaning back a little more towards that Bay design direction, but they're still not going fully that way. And I hope they keep that. Um, I think Prime looks great. I know there have been some criticisms. It's funny. One of the biggest criticisms I see in that Optimus Prime design is they say, well, he's got these gaps on the sides, right? You know, um, and he didn't have that gap in the Bumblebee movie. And, in, and they're like, oh, it, it doesn't look good. It's not G1 accurate. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't know which G1 Optimus Prime toy you had, but the one I had had gigantic gaps in that. <laughs> so he's actually very G1 accurate. <laughs> um, but as long as they keep those designs up from what we've seen of the toys and so on, I'm really happy with it. I My one quibble, and this is just a visual thing, I do wish Optimus Primal did the whole like bottom of his body rotating around thing. Cause I always found that a fun little affectation of his transformation where he's standing there. The rest of him's like just flipping up and everything and his bottom is literally kind of walking in a circle <laughs> around. But other than that, I'm digging what I'm seeing so far. Yeah, I guess what, what else do you guys, uh, you know, think about the trailers, uh, you know, Christian, are you are you thinking that it's uh, you know, is, are you positive with uh, with what you've seen so far, or are you still kind of on the fence because, you know, never sure about movie designs. The designs I'm I'm okay with. I, I like them quite a bit. Uh, the quality of the movie, I'm optimistic, but after the last night, you can never be sure. I, I, I don't I don't believe they're going to be good anymore, but they could be. I just don't I don't bank on it. They, they all have moments, you know. That's I don't think they it. all have moments. They all have a, a scene or two that like sticks mm. with you a little bit as a fan. I feel so. Age of Extinction last night. No, thank you. The problem is they they spit those moments out in the trailer, so there's not really much left when you get to the film. Except like the, enter the glue in between, you know. 
like that all those mirage scenes in the trailer look really cool like hey that's a new a new trick that we haven't seen the transformers do before but now now we've seen it just is the context going to matter Absolutely. And is it wrapped inside of a three hour long movie that, uh, you know, is a little too long? Well, here's where Age of Extinction and The Last Night were too ambitious is um, you want to just tell a story with the Dinobots get involved. Just tell a story with the Dinobots get involved. Right. Don't don't keep trying to world build to the point where you sacrifice story cohesiveness such as it is um don't keep trying to say well this is really just the first of the next six movies right if you keep throwing that message at us then the one thing we're going to wonder is well why should we care about this movie then right give me a reason to care about this one so if you took age of extinction in the last night and just broke them up into a series of vignettes <laughs> they'd be fine uh like here's a 30 minute segment of the movie about this one topic and generally, they're pretty good. But if you have to sit there for two and a half hours and go, wait a minute, what does this have to do with the thing that happened an hour ago? Right. Or is this consistent with that thing you told us two movies ago? Because you're trying to world build. Right. But so you're telling us this old dude is the last of the Witwickies, but you're not going to say anything about what happened to Sam. We just have to infer that he and his parents are dead. Maybe. <laughs> right. That's the type of thing I think they got ahead of themselves with. Um, and I say this as someone who, with Age of Extinction and The Last Night, enjoyed the spectacle of it in theaters because I saw them on, like, giant IMAX screens. And I was like, well, that was a whole lot of pretty explosion stuff. <laughs> but but I had a lot of issues with the story afterwards. And I said, well, I have all these questions and there's nothing answering them. There's not a novelization that will answer it. There's not a comic book that will answer it. So I said, all right, you guys got ahead of yourselves. And I think Bumblebee was this huge step back where they realized they got ahead of themselves. And they said, let's just tell one story and let's like really pare it down. Uh, let's do some fan service and then move on and see how that goes. And they, of course they lowered the budget and everything. And you know what? That's exactly what they needed to do. Um, I think Bumblebee is the most pure Transformers movie they've made since Dark of the Moon. And the only reason I'm saying Dark of the Moon is because Dark of the Moon is basically a G1 episode redone in live action. <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, but I I still rewatch the first 2007 movie every now and then. I think that movie's perfectly fine for what it is. And I am I will admit I'm biased. When I first saw that movie, it was at BotCon when we were all crammed into that theater. And I mean, there's nothing like watching a Transformers film with like, 200 transformers fans who are just jazzed about the movie and the first time i saw footage from the film was actually well probably about six to eight months prior i was at a hasbro press event in new york city and they showed us the sequence this is the first time they publicly showed this it was a sequence where blackout transforms and destroys the base and none of us had any idea what we were being shown we thought oh maybe just a shot of you know, Sam talking to Bumblebee or something, and then that's it. And instead, we got the whole battle sequence up until the part where he blows everything up. And that was insane. And the buzz after that, everybody was just mesmerized and, and you know, so excited about what they had seen. So I actually, unlike a lot of fans, I actually have very positive feelings about the live action film franchise as a whole. But let's say you don't like the movies at all. What you cannot deny is that financially, it did wonders for the brand. <laughs> and that for what, from 2007 to 14-ish? I mean, Transformers just dominated those shelves. You know, between a movie every other year and then the Generations brand and then Rescue Bots. And then, you know, like there was never not a time, especially when Toys R Us was still around, where Transformers just didn't fill up the better part of an aisle like they used to. You uh, the yeah. And I'm so hoping that Rise of the Beast will be like that, too, because they haven't like officially said anything, but 
clearly there are studio series toys, but I'm sure there's also going to be a kid centric line. And I think some of those leaks we've been seeing are a mashup of both. I don't think that's all studio series. I'm pretty sure some of it is studio series and some of it is like the quote unquote kid line, like the warrior classes or whatever. I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of that because they have more characters to work with. When the Bumblebee line came out, it was like, holy cow, how many Optimus Primes and Bumblebees can you put out in one wave? <laughs> it was insane. It was like 2007 um, all over again. Dude, it was nuts. It was like the shells are yellow and red and blue and that's it. Uh, but now we have an opportunity for Maximals and Predacons and Terracons all to be mushed up. I, like that whole thing that got leaked where um, a beast is essentially acting like a target master for a larger figure, I can't wait to get those in hand. Those look fun. Which apparently has no relation to Frenzy. <laughs> but yeah, that's the only thing that kind of worries me about this, uh, you know, Rise of the Beast coming out is is that there are so many different directions. And I, I really think that they can kind of fall into that same trap that they did with The Last night. Uh, or Age of Extinction, where they try to world build almost too much and the story suffers from it. So hopefully they can learn, you know, from their mistakes and, you know, try to, you know, kind of make it more towards the uh, 2007 movie or, um, you know, Dark of the Moon and, and things like that, where it's it's not quite as crazy as, as some of those later movies. So Yeah, I, we'll I agree, Lucas. I, I really hope it's, I mean, from what we've gleaned in the trailers, I'm hoping it's, you know, life is relatively peaceful on Earth. Terracons and Predacons suddenly pop out of nowhere. I don't know from where. And Scourge is this big bad, right, on the level of a Megatron. And Prime realizes he doesn't have enough guys to stop this guy because he's only got, like, what, four guys with him? And he's heard tell of these Transformers who preceded him on Earth. I don't know. There's that shot of them in the in the jungle, right? So he goes to ask him for help. And they go and they go do it. What we don't need is them to throw in like not there's an A and B and a C story probably because the humans are going to have a story, too. I don't need a D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K story. Right. And I think that's what happened with the last night. Like we didn't need any of the Unicron stuff in the last night. It, it was fun, like as a nod, but it it there was too much. Like it was like so Megatron's back. We don't know how, and <laughs> we're just going to roll with it. But he's is he working for himself, or is he working for this Quintessa, Quintesson person thing? What is she doing? Oh, she's working for Unicron, which is a nice G1 nod, but did we need this? Because <laughs> there's so much else going on in this movie, right? If they had just taken that whole segment out, it would have been a more cohesive movie. Uh, so I'm really, I, I agree with you. I'm hoping they keep it simple. Threat to Earth, bad guys, good guys get together. Maybe they conflict a little at first comic book style. Then they, they figure out we have a common goal. They take care of the bad guys. Humans happy, yay. <laughs> Roll credits. Absolutely. Sounds like a perfect movie. <laughs> well, and I, I'm also curious if, you know, because everyone says the first five minutes of the Bumblebee movie, that they absolutely loved it and, you know, that they've gotten a lot of feedback with that. I, I am curious, like, are they going to consider making that movie, like, a 90-minute or two-hour-long version of, of that? Or is that just not realistic because we have to include humans in the, uh, you know, in the story? I don't think the cost is realistic, unfortunately. From what I understand, that one sequence cost them a lot of money. Like, that was tens of millions of dollars represented in that 10 minute sequence or whatever so just the economics don't work uh that said next year well next year or the year following the next lot uh, not live action sorry the next theatrical film is supposed to be an animated transformers film focusing on the war on cybertron hmm. okay. so in a way yes but my guess is the animation style will be more akin to like a pixar film or something like that than what we saw, the kind of semi-photorealistic thing we saw um, at the beginning of Bumblebee. And that's just economics. Um, but yes, we are getting that. My understanding, however, oddly, is I think they want it kind of in its own continuity. Um, so it's not necessarily a prequel to Bumblebee, 
right? It's going to kind of be its own thing. Um, the way I'm looking at it until we get more information is I think it's probably going to play more as like treat this like the evergreen movie. Right. You know, with those evergreen designs and everything, they're kind of in their own weird G1 ish continuity, but they don't really attach to anything. I think that's what that's going to be. Great, because we didn't have enough continuities. <laughs> Why not have another one? Right. Well, I mean, the, the question is a pretty too popular is, is thing like... right now, so may as well. <laughs> Well, the other question is, is like, will Earthspark still be going at that point? Are they going, will they try to tie any of that into the the movie too? Like that, that's the thing that's, that's hard. Cause like you want again to have more world building and, you know, media to build off of each other. But uh, I don't know. It's kind of hard for it to be its own thing. I will say this. I think our thinking as older fans who, you know, either grew up with Unicron Trilogy or whatever, or with G1, we think in terms of continuity a lot, right? As sci-fi fans, we think in terms of continuity a lot, one thing connecting to another and so on. Um, based on how shows are written nowadays, like for kids and so on, like stuff that my nieces watch or what have you, I don't think kids care about that stuff as much as we do. Um, and I think if you did Earthspark for two or three years, like Cyberverse went three and a half-ish years, and then they just ended it, and then they started Earthspark. I don't think younger fans care about that. I think they're they're very good at like saying, oh, well, the animation style is so different, the voices are different, so this was its own thing, and now this is a different thing, but it's all still Transformers, right? They, they don't make that distinction, and there doesn't need to be a connection between the two. So if Earthspark kept going next year, and then the theatrical animated movie comes out at the same time, but they're not set in the same world, I think a lot of the younger fans that they're targeting won't have a problem just enjoying the two as separate things. By the same token, you know, uh, we kind of do that as older fans, right? I think when the 2007 movie came out, those fans who did enjoy it had no problem enjoying that in its own way, but then also enjoying, you know, whatever comic books were out at the time or whatever series was on TV at the time, right? Um, I think with Hasbro, the, the tightrope they have to walk is ultimately when they put out product for the entertainment, who's that going to grab, right? And they have this challenge of grabbing, like, younger kids who are in grade school all the way to us. And that's a hat trick. <laughs> and they've done it in the past, yeah. Mm -hmm. where, they, where they're just, like, I, I'm just, just blasting out all sorts of product like you were saying, coloring books and, and just fun merch and video games and just doing everything. And some of us eat up all of it and, and, and other people are allowed to pick and choose where they want to get it. Well, you know, um, it's funny. There are people I see online saying a lot, like they see Earth Spark or they or in the years past they see Cyberverse and they're, they complain a lot about it. They're like, what is all this garbage? No one's buying this stuff. And And my response to that is, you actually see, from what I see online, there is more generation stuff winding up at Ollie's, Ross, and so on than Cyberverse. What does that tell you, <laughs> right? Um, they wouldn't have made Cyberverse for three and a half years if no one was buying it. If it didn't sell year one, they would have canceled it and moved on to something else, right? right. Um, people, now, I get it from this perspective. You look at a lot of Cyberverse figures, they're not the same as Generations, right? Not as many parts in some cases, not the same features, but that's not what they're being made for, right? We want a certain level of complexity, aesthetics, and so on. Some kids out there just want Bumblebee who transforms by falling flat on his face or something, right? Um, and you know what? They got that. And the one thing I think lines like Cyberverse don't get enough credit for, and this... I'm about to make some of your listeners' heads explode by saying this. Cyberverse is much more like G1 than Generations is. Because think about what G1 was for many years. Here's another gimmick, and here's gimmicks, a subgroup gimmicks. that, yep. oh, like, these six guys have flippy guns that come out. <laughs> but these guys over here have sparks coming out of their butt. These guys over here, and they were all sold in the same year. <laughs> right? 
That's what Cyberverse was. Cyberverse was like, this guy transforms in one step. This guy talks to you. This guy is gigantic and has armor that flips up over his head. And they're all sold in the same year, right? It's them just throwing features out like crazy and seeing what sticks, right? Meanwhile, Generations, let's be real. What is Generations' primary gimmick? Transformation. That's it. Now, now with Siege, we're lucky we have blast effects, we have weaponizers, we have, you know, combining gimmicks, right? We have Menasaur, right? So, yeah, there's other gimmicks there. But if you look at the box, the box isn't really calling out those gimmicks, right? They had the whole um, Evo Fusion thing, right? That's now getting called out. But before that, we had the other feature where you were supposed to combine all the weapons. And Mark from Hasbro had posted about that on his IG. That was never on the packaging. That wasn't, yeah, that was barely <laughs> touched. Yeah. Right? Meanwhile, the same time those toys were out, you look at Cyberverse, every box is like, press this, flip that, hit this lever. It does this neat thing. Kids love that stuff. Right. And, you know, people are like, who's buying it? I'm like, you know, kids. And they're the future of fandom. Long after we walk away, they're the ones who are going to be taken over for us. So why not? It's great. <laughs> I might say it's parents. Of kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's that's the thing. As much as we are all kind of in our own little bubble, you know, you're, you're right that there are a lot of different demographics that they're trying to appease. You know, not not just the 30 to 40 year old collector market, you know, that uh, that, you know, they are going after the kids and the teenagers and and the parents of of kids uh, as well. So and um, I don't know, I, I figure probably most parents are not as impressed by pain apps as what we are. <laughs> um, I will tell you when I was a kid and I would ask a relative to buy me a toy. Transformer Star Wars doesn't matter. The first question they would always ask after how much is it is what does it do? Right? Because they wanted to know that they were purchasing something that had some type of action feature or would keep me engaged as a kid in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very fair question for parents to ask. If you're going to spend $20, $30 on a figure, it should have an action feature or electronics or something like that. Um I don't think as older fans with Generations, we care about that stuff as much. I really don't care that there are no electronics in Generations figures. I kind of don't want them because they tend to hamper other things, right? But for a, a Bumblebee figure that transforms very simply, but now he can talk to the kid and say, you're a hero and let's go fight the Decepticons. I think that's wonderful because when I was six or seven, I would have loved something like that. <laughs> Plus, you know, it's interesting. I've there's this weird impression I get from complaints that fans put out there that Hasbro doesn't like know what they're doing. Like they don't test market any of this stuff that there's no research. You know, I'll put it out there right now. I don't know all the details, but I do know enough that a lot of research goes into everything they put out. You know, there are test groups done. There are surveys done. There are um, surveys that have younger fans, older fans, you know, middle of the road fans. Um, some of them are online. Some of them are by phone. Some of them are done by video conference. Some of them are done in person. When it comes to the play features of stuff like Cyberverse or Earthspark, they put those prototypes in the hands of kids and they say, Go do something with that. And they watch those kids and they make sure they're actually going to be able to figure it out and do it and enjoy it. And if they don't, they go back to the drawing board. So long before you see that product on shelf, it's gone through the ringer already before you you can buy it. And that doesn't mean it's always going to succeed. It doesn't. But, you know, I think some folks have this impression that like, Person A at Hasbro wakes up one morning and says, you know what would be great if a toy did this? He draws it, it's prototyped the next day, and it's manufactured in three weeks. <laughs> and then it's shipped from Asia, and it's here six months later, and then boom, that's how the product got on shelf. No, there are a bazillion conference calls that happen between the concept and the time you see it on shelf, and a lot of analysis that's done. So, you know, this is a good thing. This is how it's always been done, and it should be done. 
because ultimately, look, we've had it good, guys, with Generations and Masterpiece and so on, what we've been talking about, but it's not going to, it's all for naught if no one under 40 wants to have anything to do with this toy line in a few years. Right, exactly. I think the I think the main the main thing that we can take from from just that part alone is uh, the the core focus of, of toys uh, overall is, is is play value. That that's the entire intention and purpose behind a toy existing at, at all is you know something to help children to have fun. It's it's uh, part of why we value this brand and, and and other similar brands the way that we do. And why in, in our adult years, we've come to treat them as, as more, I guess, more, more display pieces or not, not by statues, but, you know, it's like we will display them in robot mode or then we'll display them in vehicle mode or whatever, you know, because they remind us of days when we would take a bumblebee or a, uh, I don't know, horrid bull or, or uh, one of the Omnibots and just fling them off the porch strapped to a bottle rocket, you know, run them through the mud puddle in the backyard. <laughs> You know, or you know, like the sparking <laughs> box. You know, uh, we was like gonna catch this piece of paper on fire. You know, just, just being a kid. Yeah. And so that that's what their their focus is, you know, primarily. Whereas generations, it's like, hey, remember when you know you guys used to have these growing up? Here they are again. Yeah. Revisit that feeling. New and improved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jim, I think oh. you're uh, concerning Peter over there. Oh, <laughs> Peter's was, like, no! He's like, wait, what are you talking about? I, I played with my toys very gently as a kid, except for maybe the Sparkabots, where you know you you want to get the oh, sure. rrr, rrr, and then their chests would get all scratched up, and then you'd be oh, sad. Man. But other than that, I was very gentle with my toys. They did not. That's why you pushed down even harder. I, I just wish someone had told me Horrible's beast head would fall off like that years later, so I would have yeah. bought a few more back in the day. That, that <laughs> does remind me of a, of a point from, from earlier in the discussion, though. Uh, we were, we were just not, not to backtrack too far, but we were talking about you know the, the third party and all that. And I just happened to think one area where the third parties really missed the boat completely, Titan's Return. Sure. How many times do we have like the, the, the Titan Master or the Headmaster figures Never had the transtector bodies for you know like like you know, night beat or horrible mm-hmm. or terrible whatever you call them uh, you know all, all these others that could have had bodies that may have been compatible with a Hasbro product if you chose to do so but wasn't required. I I have a lot of friends who at the time were very into third party and they kept saying that they kept saying oh well we got this night beat head so third party is going to make a body and they kept saying it like for the whole year <laughs> towards the end of the year i was like i don't think it's happening man <laughs> like there hasn't but been here's something to fill some body. panels <laughs> i, th- I think um, there was one company that made a jet fire that was a headmaster right and i don't know if they were intending to make more but they never really got i mean the stuff off the ground i think the thing that's so hard with all that is is the lead time on all these figures is so long long that uh by the time you have that idea to the time it actually like gets produced and you know if it's a success or not is is usually a couple years so it's it's uh it can be kind of tricky i would argue they could do it now and people would buy it like if they did a night beat body now people would buy it because we still haven't gotten uh, night beat we're close <laughs> very close but we're not there yet right um and yeah the other thing i was going to say you know, reminding a third party in play is uh, i gave that earlier example of glacial lord i think that's a great example of play because each glacial lord was essentially kind of a brain master right kind it had of, the yeah. little figure kind of became the face right um and then you know each thing could transform on its own and then eat, they all combine into the combiner and i was like okay now someone's thinking about these things like toys because i i talked i remember back when third party stuff was really gaining traction i talked to a couple friends and i said um you know what what do you do with this is this a toy are you ever gonna separate those combiner limbs and you know, because they would have like the Predaking displayed as Predaking. And I said, no, I'm never taking this thing apart. <laughs> I said, oh, so it's just going to stand on your shelf like that. They said, yeah. 
I was like, would you let your kids touch it? He's like, oh, hell no. <laughs> this thing costs you 600 something dollars and the wings could cut your finger off. No, my kids are not going to touch it. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> you're right. They kind of missed the boat there. Um, I think third party. One thing I love is uh, and I, I don't collect third party full figures, but I love accessories. Right. Do you guys uh, any of you guys have the no nef like blasters and stuff? Oh, yeah. I mean, that stuff is great. When he made that mini bot pack of weapons, uh, I was down. I was like, yeah, my Outback's getting a nice big gun, <laughs> you know, and then he made the uh, the weapons for the the clones. Uh, they were perfect. I was like, this guy is great. I, I need more of this. He's kind of slowed down a bit, but that kind of stuff, I love. Anything that adds play value, anything that adds to the figure, I'm down with. You know, in my book, if you need the official figure to like kind of complete what this goes with, it's fine by me. Case in point with uh, none of, uh, I don't have, oh yeah, I do have a crankcase here. He just did a, uh, a backpack. I don't have the kit yet, but there's a backpack you can plug into his back, and his oh, nice. trigger, his trigger con weapons. He gets the out. real trigger con weapons. It makes yeah, not the little. I mean, I'm so glad that we got a crankcase officially now, and it's he's beautiful. I can't wait to open him up and play with him. But there is that extra play value that some of these uh, third party add on yeah. things do. That we're lucky to have them. Totally agree. Well, and I think it would be interesting to see, you know, the uh, third. Um, 3d printed uh, accessories as well like that market has really kind of taken off the last couple of years and there's a few different shops uh, from China right with TF Safari uh, and, and just the other various you know ones that are making some of this stuff and uh, I'll be curious to see the pro proliferation of some of that and like you know kind of how things progress um, you know because I, I would assume that 3d printing some of that stuff that they can make things a little more um you know like smaller runs and, and things like that but i don't know it's i guess it's hard to say like the cost of, of some of that some of that stuff but um you know the the cost obviously of 3d printing versus injection molding is, is I, I believe it's probably a lot lower right yeah i i don't know what the economics are like in scale um, but I would imagine 3D printing, like just a very small run of a gun for a figure is a lot cheaper, you know, with injection molding. First, you have to just make the economic case for spending $100,000 on tooling and that'll stop you dead most of right. the time. I mean, that's why we don't have um, we haven't got another accessory pack. Right. Um, like the one that came with Centurion drone. Mm -hmm. That was brilliant. I, okay, except for the Optimus Prime rifle. Don't know what the heck was happening there. <laughs> but other than that, I thought that was a fantastic pack. And um, but and uh, there were rumors that there was going to be another one because there's a lot of other accessories they could make, but it never came to fruition. That type there's of thing, 3D printing. Hmm? There's been two more. We had Tricranius with the Blast Effects pack and then the Red yeah. Hog weapons and accessory pack. Oh, I meant like with a whole bunch of G1 themed bits that ah, other figures didn't come with, like Ironhide's drill and stuff like that. Yeah, another pack like that uh, would have been super fun, I think. No. Um, but, you know, I mean, they had to tool that up, right? I'm sure it cost them a bazillion dollars to do that. Here's the thing, though. That pack sold so well. I am absolutely convinced if they did another production run of that pack with that drone, it would sell out again. Oh um, yeah, the the aftermarket prices on that set alone went what? bonkers. Yeah, it was it was uh, yeah unreal. Um, uh, in, in that Centurion pack, uh, the the Optimus rifle was was it identical to the one from Earthrise? No, it was no. far far larger. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so we're talking like four slim G one rifle versus the bloated G one rifle. Is that the difference? <laughs> No, it's like it's way out of scale with anything else that exists. Oh, it's Boomstick. bizarre because ostensibly it was for a generation's figure, but it was like it was even big for a masterpiece. Uh, like maybe, Optimus Maximus. Maybe? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe MPO one it would have been fine with, but. Yeah, I was when I took it out. I actually was glad a lot of people mentioned it online because at first I thought, did I get? 
some screwed up <laughs> like production run and i opened two of them and i said no they're they're both like that and then my friend opened his and he's like no mine's like that <laughs> i said okay so you know i'll just focus on all the other stuff in here and put that back in the box but first of all uh, just shout out to hasbro for recognizing the value of transformers troop builders now um because we've been wanting that for how long and that was one of the first and i I, I would love I only have two. I would love to have like four or five of those just as a little army uh, accessories aside. Uh, I bought uh, one I bought three tricraniuses, uh, partly because I love blast effects and partly because I love those colors on them are gorgeous. And then a friend was getting rid of his because he just wanted the blast effects. <laughs> so I paid him ten bucks and just bought the figure off of him. Um, anything like that, I think weaponizers, uh, uh, fossilizers, and now the junkions that are coming out. I mean, this is great stuff. We've been wanting this forever, and those junkions, freaking brilliant. <laughs> oh, Love yeah, it. Yeah, that was a great idea. I still have the, the sneaking suspicion that uh, those junkions are uh, going to be. Uh, ending up as a combiner at some point later on. Just my hunch. I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, they may not be the most stable combiner in the world, but you've got a Voyager one coming out, and then you've got four, you know, uh, deluxes, I think. And even if you did it, you could just buy four of the same deluxe <laughs> and use him for lives. Uh, people are already combining... Um, they're taking the Junkie on, and they're combining it with other, like, a Voyager class figure just to kind of show conceptually how this could work. Uh, I'm I'm totally down with it. Scrapbook's bio on the Hasbro site mentions that explicitly. There you go. So one question I have kind of, you know, shifting gears a little bit again, you know, Ben, I know that you've, you know, been around for a while. Like, you know, what have you seen of, um, you know, the... The Transformers fandom over the years, like, what differences do you see, you know, now versus how things used to be, um, you know, whatever, 20 years ago, whatever it may be, um, you know, bo both with the fandom and then, you know, with Hasbro, too, and how, like, we've been able to, um, you know, kind of access them. Like, how, how how's Hasbro different, too? Well, let's start with the hasbro thing because that's the kind of easiest one to answer the biggest game changer with hasbro is social media because between their facebook page and their ig and so on and their online uh youtube uh, presentations where there's a chat on the side they are getting more direct feedback from fans than ever before right um when fans are worried they are not being heard believe me they go through those chats they go through the Facebook comments. They go through the Twitter, whatever's. They they go through all of it because they want to catch trends, and then they want to market on those trends. That's what any good company would do, and they do that. 25, 30 years ago, there was nothing like that. The closest, if you were lucky, you could get maybe write a physical letter in <laughs> to Hasbro, and maybe someone in marketing might see it, and tell the team, hey, check out this letter we got from this kid, right? Like when all the angry parents wrote in about Optimus Prime dying in 86, right? That's as close as you're going to get back in the day. So the dynamic between fans and Hasbro, and not just Hasbro as a company, right? Hasbro marketing guys slash design guys who directly work on the product, there's a straight line now. Um I mentioned earlier that there are these media roundtables they hold every now and then with some of the sites and, and podcasts and so on. That's another avenue that 25, 30 years ago didn't exist, right? Fan media was not real media back then, right? My website, when it first started, was not anything they cared about until I accidentally violated one of their trademarks. <laughs> so, and that's when I got their attention. But because I I'm sorry, what, Beast... what was this now? You well, you... I registered BeastWars.net back in the day, yeah. and and I already had friends at Hasbro at that point because I had met them at BotCon, and they said, "Look, Ben, we can't let you keep using that. You know, we need that. You know, we need that 
let's work something out. And we worked something out. And to this day, I have a fantastic relationship with Hasbro, but it's not the same people from 1997. It's, you know, a whole new generation of people. Almost every few years, it's a whole new group. But, you know, that's a unique relationship that I have with Hasbro that, you know, I'm very, you know, I treasure it. I'm very grateful for it. But now you don't have to be me or the Hartmans or whoever to have a channel into Hasbro. Once upon a time, you did have to be Carl and John Hartman to be able to talk to Hasbro, right? Nowadays, you just have to be on their Facebook page. <laughs> Anyone can do that, which is awesome. And But kudos to Hasbro then for reading those comments and saying, huh, okay, let's do something different here. Um, I will tell you in Legacy, uh, people have obviously been seeing, they're kind of go a little wild with some of the character choices, right? Like a genuine G2 G axis, needle nose out of nowhere, right? Crankcase out of nowhere. Well, some of that came from them reading comments. Like, you know, when they read, when they read, oh, well, people seem to really dig Crankcase in IDW's comics. And, you know, he could be retooled from skids. Let's just do it, right? And we got it. Um, people heard that when they were thinking about doing needle nose, right? one of the conversations they had to have was, is he going to have target masters? And they heard from way back in the Titans Returns era, people will accept but are not crazy about buying a traditionally target master character without target masters, right? They'll buy it, but they're going to grumble about it. So they figured out a way to make sure Needle Nose had his target masters, right? So there are things that we kind of just have that we take for granted, I think, as a fandom sometimes, that you got to realize as a fandom, we affected that. That happened because we said something. You, do you think that Armada Optimus Prime on the Legacy Evolution art is an accident? <laughs> Takara showed off that prototype, which they never made. Fans have been bugging Hasbro about it for, what, five, six years now? Like, every time there's an event. So, when are we getting that Armada Prime? So, how about that Armada Prime, <laughs> right? So, now we're going to get it. I mean, I'm pretty much assuming everything on that poster is getting made into a toy. So, we're getting, I don't know when, but we're going to get it. Great. That didn't happen in a vacuum. That happened because fandom spoke up. Fandom said, I love your product. I want more of it. This thing got shown off. Please, please, please give me that. Um, Whoever thought we'd see Dragon Megatron and Leo Convoy again? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Well, and a Leo Prime who is not oh, a Prime. redeco of like Leo Breaker, right, <laughs> you know, right. or something, you know, right? Um, and once upon a time, the only hope we would have for such things or anything close to it would be like the Collectors Club or a Botcon exclusive or something like that. And now, in between selects, generations, and the exclusive lines, we have all these figures that, frankly, if you kind of look at the spread, a lot of it is stuff that fans have been asking for for a long time, mixed in with some surprises. Because I'll tell you, that Galaxy Shuttle took me by surprise, <laughs> and it's one of my favorite things. So um, from the in terms of Hasbro and fans, fans... Keep posting on Facebook. Keep writing them on social media. When you're at events, like if you're at a live event or like at SDCC or something, talk to them. Be professional. Be polite. Be kind and understand that, they, especially at SDCC, they've got 50 things coming at them at one time. <laughs> but ultimately, they're listening because you know what? They want to hear from fans. They want to know what's going to give them the chance to get our money. And that sounds so mercenary, but let's be real. We are in a capitalist society. That's what this is about. They are not a nonprofit. <laughs> they are here to, they have bills, they have mortgages, they have to buy eggs too. So they want to know, how do I get your money? Um, so we're in a fantastic place now more than ever, because if we had had this conversation 10 years ago, there weren't as many social channels. They weren't doing Pulse live streams, right? Now we have all these ways you can communicate with them. I say as a fandom, we do it politely and we take advantage of it as much as we can. Um, but now how has fandom changed? Well, I remember fandom being a very small thing because I came into online fandom in the late 90s uh, through news, Usenet news groups. And... There were maybe at any given time 20 or 30 regular people 
and then people would drop out and people would drop in. Um, and we kind of would have the same discussions over and over again. Is Frenzy red? Is he blue? <laughs> you know, uh, did you notice this animation error in this one episode? Yes, we all noticed that. That's why we're here. Uh, and Remember the whole Braun Lives campaign? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and it was fun, you know, and I, I'm a big believer in Braun Lives. So, <laughs> you know, um, I think for a time we were a very tiny community online and we felt this was it. We are a bunch of guys teenagers early 20s who are just kind of you know shooting the breeze about the old days and i think that's where we thought it was going to go dead beast wars comes and we're like wait a minute we're relevant again we're in the conversation again but then what has what happened then and has continued to happen since is segmentation of the fandom so then you had your guys who were never going to let G1 go. Beast Wars is not real Transformers. I refuse to ever accept it. Even after Agenda aired, even after the season, the series finale aired, and you saw the arc, and you saw the nemesis, and all that, they didn't care. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't their Transformers. So we left them behind. Uh, some of my friends have told me they're a lot like some of the older Joe collectors who couldn't accept three and three quarter. And you know it was like 12 inch or nothing. Right. And then they got left behind when a real American. Grit, baby. <laughs> so um, and then every time another show came out, you had a segment of fandom that grew. Right. Fandom started growing, but a segment would get left behind and left behind. Right. Um, there were exceptions like no one left behind because of R.I.D. 2001. I think everybody just kind of accepts that as this fun blip. It only lasted a year. Let's move on. Right. Um, that was so lovely, though. Yeah, it was great. But Ru then Ru had... Ru ruination, thirty bucks. Come on. Oh, so many ruination redecos. <laughs> <laughs> but then you had Unicron trilogy, which was really the on ramp for a whole new generation of fans after the Beast era. And then you started losing some of the Beast era guys, right? Because now they were getting older and their lives were changing. They're like, ah, oh, this is like Pokemon for Transformers. It's not really my thing. Uh, I'm gonna go back and watch Beast Wars. You know, and that has happened consistently for decades now. But because we don't have an animated show every year, necessarily, it doesn't happen in the same way anymore. So now segmentation is happening in the toy line as well. So you have people who are just generations. So since Universe 2.0, that's been their through line. Right. Um, but you have some people who they got to generations, you know, and they just said, oh, what's all this video game stuff? I don't I don't care about any of this. Right. I'm out. <laughs> and then maybe now they're coming back in with like Studio Series 86 and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, that Ironhide looks like the one I grew up with. So I'm going to get that. Um, but there's they're still very limited. They're picking and choosing. Right. The era of I will get everything I think is over. There are very few fans, I believe, who can afford to buy everything from rescue bots all the way to Generations, all the way to Masterpiece. Um, there's just too much product. And I think now, I see this a lot in discussions online where there's a lot of comparisons that happen, right? Fandom will say, well, this Earthspark toy isn't a good toy because it doesn't have as many parts and joints as this Generations Deluxe figure. And it's it's not a fair comparison, but it is a comparison that happens. And I think that's where we are right now in fandom. It's this weird kind of trying to stabilize and, and normalize what is a real Transformer? What is a real Transformers fan? What is the superior Transformer? And, you know, the problem with that argument is that's not a thing. <laughs> you know, if you want to compare toys, you got to go apples to apples. You want to compare a deluxe class to a deluxe class? Okay, even then you're going to have some problems, okay? But to compare a toy that's $14.99 and does one thing well to a toy that's 25 and just transforms and then has like 5 millimeter ports everywhere, they're not the same thing. Like, do you eat an orange and compare it to the watermelon you had yesterday? <laughs> you know? Um, in, and I in, think... a line, in a line that's, that's always changing... Uh, that that just that almost seems like a like a, a silly argument to engage in. Yeah, 
you know, to, to go at someone else is like, well, my, mine's transformier than yours. My, mine's the transformiest. Well, yeah. I think, you know, I mean, and, and, then, and then you get studio series with, uh, with, with the regular main line and then the, uh, the, the buzzworthy, uh, variants, you know, and then, then, you know, if you're trying to complete, you know, based on the, on the numbers alone, some are, some of them are in bump and buzzworthy and not in studio series. So I think people you got to compare those like, two. I think people do it to justify the choices that they make because again, like we don't all have infinite money in space. And so, you know, we're making those choices. And so if you come through and you made the opposite choice that I did, you know, you're like, wait, like what, you know, sometimes it could come across that like I'm putting down your choice because I made a different choice than, than what you did. So, I mean, I could kind of see, you know, some of that. Well, that, and but that's a segment of fandom, right? Now, here's the segment of fandom I put myself in. And, I, and there is a significant group, and I think most of us here would put ourselves in the same group, is I buy what I like, <laughs> right. Right? right? This amuses me. This is cool. This is neat. I will own it, right? Um, and I think uh, something that's also happened, and this is inevitable, right? This is any entertainment it doesn't just have to be Transformers. It can be G.I. Joe. It can be movies. It can be TV shows. I think there's a there's an advantage that some of us older fans have where we grew up on a very specific type of Transformer, right? On a very specific design philosophy. And we saw that the de design philosophy change over the years. Pretenders, throttle bots, right? But we always accepted them as this is a Transformer. Um, it's different. Like no one's going to say that G1 Prowl from 84 is the same quality toy as Goldbug, right? But they were both precious parts of my collection when I was a kid, right? And they were on the same team and they did many missions together. And boy, did I have a lot of fun having Goldbug, you know, pull back and ram into a Decepticon. Um, that flexibility in thought of what a Transformer is I have found changes largely depending on where you started with Transformers. Um, the earlier you started, the more flexible your thinking is. And I'm overgeneralizing here. There are a lot of exceptions to what I just said. But I find G1 fans, except for, what do they call them, the G1ers? Like, they're, they're kind of in their own corner. Let's not worry about them. But G1 fans like me, I'll just use myself as an example, I've seen Transformers as Jim said, change so much over the years. And I've loved them and accepted them in so many different forms that I always welcome a new form, right? Um, I am one of those people who, once it went to mostly MicroMasters and Pretenders, I hung in there. I was still buying them. I was still enjoying them. Most of my friends who were into them dropped out at that point because they were like, oh, they don't become real cars anymore or realistic vehicles or whatever. I'm out. No more diecast metal. I'm out, right? And I was like, no, but this big car has a little thing in it and there's a little guy in it and <laughs> like, it's got guns everywhere. Like that to me was cool. And that flexibility continues to this day where uh, like with beast wars, which is a huge sea change. I was like, okay, so they're all kind of fuzzy critters now. All right, show me the toys, you know, and the toys were great. Uh, Armada. Okay. Is it Pokemon for Transformers? Yes, it is. But it looks fun. <laughs> and I like MicroMasters. So that's great. Right. Um, and now here we are with Earthspark, um, you know, and you've got these cute little chibi uh, Tacticon figures that go on your finger, which I think are adorable and remind me of something that would have come out in Japan, right, during the Choro Q era and stuff like that. And I'm sure someone out there right now is trying to say, well, that's taking up the space that my deluxe figure should be on. <laughs> you know? You know, you know what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's cute. <laughs> it's not fun. To, uh, it's a toy. Not, not, not to derail things too far, but you you referencing Armada being the, the Pokemon of Transformers, I just, I just had this mental image uh, now, uh, you know, the, the whole got to catch them all thing, you know, with, with the minicons. Unicron literally being the largest Pokeball in the universe. He is a large Pokeball. Yeah. <laughs> and his dandruff with the minicons. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, with, with with fandom now, it's I think there's a lot of, tr I think you were right, Lucas. There's a lot of trying to say, well, I have to somehow justify this thing 
And one of the methods, I'm stressing one of the methods that some people, again, some people employ to do that is by somehow trying to show how superior their choice is over someone else's. Uh, a lot of third party collectors do this. Like every time you reveal a generation, you could just post a generation's photo, right? I got this figure. I really love him. Some person always has to jump in. Well, I got third party, blah, blah, blah. So I don't need it. And I'm like, good for you. <laughs> Mine's transformer here. You know, <laughs> like, okay. Um, uh, so I like that word, transformer. That's a, I, that is kind of what it is. That's one of the things I have seen happen. But the, the flip side of that, which I, th I think Peter was going to agree with me on, is like, I, I saw this thread once online where someone said, uh, it, was, it was basically as Jim said, what's the most transformiest transformer, <laughs> you know, in your collection? And this whole discussion began about people showing pictures like third party, generations, masterpiece, like this one's superior to this one and this one's superior to this one. And I jumped in and I was like, none of you are right like none of you are more transformy than the rest like everything you're showing is a toy you love it's fun and that's what matters let me show you a toy that i love and i posted g2 stacks who i think is one of i love g2 stacks he is a terrible action figure. <laughs> like it's, that whole line bullet bike all of them ironhide they are not great toys but oh my god do i love them because I got them, I didn't know they existed. A friend in the UK got them for me just to date myself. So we were pen pals, physical letters, had forth. And he would send me pictures, like catalogs, like Xeroxes, and say, here's what's out in the UK right now. Do you want any of this? And I see these G2 Power Masters, and I'm like, what are those? <laughs> you know, because there was an Ironhide. And, and I was like, all four of them, get me. So he got them for me. Four to six weeks later, right? They wind up in my mailbox. And I took them out. I'm like, these things are great. Like, I have a new Ironhide. He becomes a Hummer. You know, who's this bullet? And it was new character, Stax, Bullet Bike. That was exciting to me. And to this day, I look at those toys and I feel nothing but affection. Now, are they articulated? God, no. <laughs> are they big? Do they have a lot of parts? No. <laughs> but I love them. They're fun. And and that was my contribution to discussion. And I've done that a few times since, like whenever someone's like, show us a piece from your collection that you love. I'm like, stacks, <laughs> just put them over there or iron eyed. And so many people are like, what is that? That's a transformer. And I'm like, yes, he's very transformy. <laughs> Clearly from such a different era when you could spend the time sending letters back and forth and the products would still be on the shelf. By My the God. Time. Yeah. By the time you said yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the good thing is my friend was very smart. He would shortcut the whole thing. He would tell me how much everything cost. And he would say, when you write back and tell me what you want, you got to include the money order so I can go grab them right away. Um, and I wasted no time. I responded to him within 24 hours every single time. Like that mail, that mail drop was done. The money order was on the way. <laughs> um 24 hours, meaning about two weeks of postage. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, here's the thing. So that, that actually does connect to something else. Now, in terms of the state of fandom, I'm going to tell you one thing I love when I see in fandom. And I've been seeing this more and more. We talked earlier about how distribution is difficult and how it's hard to find things. Something I do see more and more now, because distribution is not what it used to be, is people helping each other out. I love, love, love when people post from a store and they go, I just found a Cosmos or I just found a Galaxy Shuttle. I'm going to be here for the next half hour. Comment here if you need this. And all I'm asking is cost and shipping. You hooked me up with that red alert. Please. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that Example. to me, that's one of the core parts of what fandom should be about is we should be there for each other. You know, I mentioned that Usenet news group that I first joined online fandom on. I am still friends with about 10 people from there, uh, from the old days. I met my significant other through a friend that I made on there, <laughs> you know, like 10, 13, 14 years ago that he introduced us. But, you know, she and I wouldn't be together if it weren't for all Toys Transformers, which is insane to think about. Um, 
And I remember back in the day on the news group, a lot of people, you know, different regions get toys earlier than other regions, especially back then. And I had a friend who lived in the Midwest and he was because he was near Kenner. He was always getting Beast Wars stuff first. Like everything was hitting his shelves before, like a month before they would hit mine. And every now and then I'd beg him. I'd be like, hey, you know, I remember he got me like Snapper. I was like, I saw you got Snapper. Could you grab me one? You know, Um, and he was just so nice about it. And fans in general, I I have found if you get past all the silly debates and everything, a lot of fans are very kind people who want to help each other out because they understand the challenges that other fans are going through. Um, And I like to think that fans feel a sense of satisfaction when they do that. I know, Jim, when I helped you get your red alert, that made me feel good, right? Helping out a friend, right? Um, And... When I post photos of like, you know, stores, when when I'm out shopping, I'll post it partly because I want people who live in the area like, hey, if you're around, this is what's there. Go get it if you need anything. Uh, I love stuff like that. So there's some very wonderful, positive aspects of fandom. Uh, Also, the other part of fandom that I don't think gets as much shout out as it used to is fan fiction. Um. Back in the old days, you know, I used to actually get a print fan fiction thing from a couple different fans every month. And it would be accumulated artwork and stories of different fans. But now fans can just put their artwork to DeviantArt, Twitter, and so on. So there's a short circuit to just getting it out to the fandom. Artwork, there's plenty of. But fan fiction, I don't see as much as I used to. But it's out there. And I think that's a wonderful expression of enthusiasm. If you're going to invest your time, your effort into something like that into a creative endeavor like that and you're not asking for any money no profit that's a huge sign of your dedication to the brand and it's still out there and i think that's a wonderful thing i'm so glad that hasn't gone away yeah it's, it's been a long time since i've uh, checked out any, any fan fiction but there, there was there was quite a lot of it that uh, stood out to me that was actually actually quite good there was uh, there was one called sparks of the past that uh, that I, I really enjoyed and then there was another one that was uh, uh, macro masters if you remember Macro Master, I do. Done, yeah. Well, so, just the the, the character so of, uh, was uh, Monstrosity or Monstro City. That that was that was just so fun. That was Don, right? Yeah, that was Don. Yeah, and he made customs of all the characters, and they were like massive, wonderfully, G you know, like G one type toys. They're beautiful. Yeah, ATT was great. And it, it connected me to a lot of people that I, I mean, I had no idea, like going online on, in 95 and 96. And, it, you know, I was 15 at that point. So it was it was a whole new world. I thought I was the only kid mm-hmm. who cared about Transformers anymore. All of my other friends had gone off with girls and sports and whatever else they were into. And I was like an island. And then we got on AOL and I found the news groups and was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of us. Out? Yeah, this is great. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I feel like that that's one thing that's been great about social media, you know, like you mentioned about the Instagram and and Facebook groups and, you know, all the various groups is is that it can connect all of us in our love of Transformers, that it's like even if you aren't able to find that, you know, both to be able to find local, you know, friends with interests, but then also just to be able to connect with people across the country, across the world, uh, to share that similar love. And and that's a key word, Lucas, is, is love, right? For me, fandom should be about the love, right? It, 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 enjoying Transformers should be about the love. You're here because you enjoy a thing. You're not here because you hate a thing, right? And if you are, well, okay, that's on you. Uh, <laughs> um, I remember... It almost goes back to play value. Yeah. Uh, well, what's, uh, what's that Marie Kondo thing? Does it spark joy in you? Right. Oh, yes. uh, I've told myself because people have asked me before, oh, you've been doing your website for 20 plus years. When are you going to hang it up? Because unlike Sabertron or TFW, I don't do my site for a living. That's my side hobby. You know, I have a full time job on top of that. Um, and I said the day I don't feel that joy anymore, the, the day where I pick up a transformer and I'm like, eh, <laughs> you know, and I I will know that it's time to kind of walk away maybe for a little while, then come back or something like that. But I got to tell you guys, I, I can't get there yet. You know, I, I look at stacks every now and then and I still love them. I, uh, 
um, I just did some pictures of um, uh, Buster and Hydra, you know, and those guys. And I love I mean, they're not the most articulated things in the world. They're kind of chunky. But boy, are they fun. And boy, they're big, <laughs> you know. Um, and I always uh, there's a very special emotion and nostalgia that I attach to some of the older toys versus the newer ones. And that bar keeps moving, by the way. So like when Beast Wars was new, of course, that was all generation two and back. Now I'm looking like as Kingdom and Legacy go on, I'm taking out Beast Wars toys to photograph with the new versions. And I'm like, oh, look at this, <laughs> you know, chunky thing or whatever. L look at Tarantulas and his, you know, his clear plastic or whatever. You know, it's like it, it just takes you back. And I mean we're at the point, and this is how frightening this is, we're at the point now where, like, Unicron Trilogy does that, too. It's like, you know, you take out the original hotshot, put it next to the, you know, you're like, wow, what a world of difference this is. But you still feel this, like, but this hotshot was so fun. Like, he was a whole toy built around one gimmick, <laughs> and it worked. And this, this is going to be the, the third callback to that hotshot, too. Yeah, yeah. That's um, insane. The more successful one, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, I think. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think, um, uh, I got into this weird, I'll call it a debate, um, on Facebook, uh, a couple of months ago and it was off putting because there, there were these two fans, I'll call them fans. I didn't know them. They, this was a big group and they just randomly jumped into a thread and they just went on and on about how. Hasbro was evil and they didn't know what they were doing and how they just wanted to hurt fans. And it was such a strange conversation. And there are corners of the fandom that say things like that on a fairly regular basis. And I said, look, I, I can assure you, no one at Hasbro is going home going, how can I hurt fandom tomorrow? <laughs> you know, no one at Hasbro was going, how can I take away paint applications or take away points of articulation? You know, that's not what people do in that company. They they're in the business of making fun things and making us happy so that we'll give them our money. <laughs> and I it felt weird that I had to explain that. And and I tried to like explain to the guys like trust me I, i've been talking to hasbro people for 20 plus years like every few months i talk to these people i know what they're thinking a lot of the time and it's it's all good like it's all good vibes we're in good hands and this dude absolutely would not believe me started attacking me instead that's when the block button comes in handy right. um I, I you know i can't get involved in that kind of back and forth like the old days like i i don't have that much free time it's like dude you i told them you want to go be angry you go be angry i can't tell you how to spend your time i'm just telling you that in my opinion we're in good hands with the people that we're working with right now well and you can really tell that too with um you know again like mark and the instagram channel that he has and like some of the direct connections that that he has with with people and some of the explanations that he gives for some of the designs of figures that you know i mean you can just tell that there's love being put into those figures like they can't always like they can't always realize their dream at the price point they're trying to do it you know what i mean they have to may, may have to not necessarily create what they what they wanted or a hundred percent of that. But I, I feel for the most part, I mean, you can tell that a lot of those designers, you know, really do love what they're putting out. I mean, Mark writes like three paragraphs <laughs> on everything he puts up. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I, I see how much he and Sam write sometimes. And I'm like, you typed all that out on your phone. <laughs> I, I would spend an hour doing that with how much I fat figure, but they really want to get the word out there. They really want to show us, Hey fans, look how much love we put into this. Right. And that's a wonderful thing. Yep. So, yeah, yeah I was going to say, I think a lot of the interaction we've had, <laughs> it changes in, in phases. We've gotten to a more social media driven, uh, correspondence with Hasbro, but it has a lot to do with the people behind the scenes, or not even behind the scenes, the people that are willing to spend that extra time. Yeah. Like that is that is probably like their whole day job, and then that. 
you know, like, oh, I have an extra hour, I'm going to write this little blog post or something. They do it because they want to. Yeah, and um, if you listen to a lot of what Mark even says on those Pulse streams and stuff, when he references stuff like, oh, we wanted, we couldn't really budget flippy cannons on crankcase, but we wanted something there. So he's got these little nubby cannons. Well, there was a very pure intent there, and he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to think about that. You know, let's be real. If those little nubby cannons weren't there, we still would have bought the darn thing. But they're there, and they're fun. You can't attach blast effects or anything to them, but hey, I'm happy they thought about it. <laughs> you know, um, when you look at the Haslabs, right? If you look at Victory Saber, if, if we went back in time and each of us told our younger selves from 15 years ago that there was Haslab would even be a thing, that Victory Saber was going to be one of those things, we'd be like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Hasbro doesn't care about Victory Saber or whatever, you know? They did one homage in the Unicron trilogy, and we've never seen hide nor hair of it since, right? We, we wouldn't believe ourselves, yet here we are. And now we're going to get our space chicken, <laughs> you know? For us. Yeah, I mean, this is great stuff. <laughs> and I'll tell you, even when Deathsaurus funded... And I felt the same way when Unicron funded, and I felt the same way when Victory Saber funded. I was kind of in disbelief for, you know, like 15 minutes. I was like, did it really happen? Oh, I hope, I hope like, they don't do a recount, and it turns out we didn't fund, you know. Um, but uh, that's another – You ask, we're asking about fandom. I think that's another big uh, bit of confidence I think Hasbro is showing in fandom, Right. We're going to put this crazy thing out there, this crazy project out there, this Kickstarter-like thing. And we're going to trust that you guys are going to go with it. And you know what? With Transformers fandom, we have every single time. Well, we and, have a... Yeah. I was going to say, Unicron was definitely... I mean, they, they really had to kind of push things over the line, I feel yep. like, with, with that. And, I mean... I didn't feel the same way about Star Saber and Desaurus that I did with that. Like, they're... You know, because they funded quicker but unicron i was like is this actually going to happen and like once they showed it off you're like man i really want this for yeah. my collection i really hope that this happens um yeah. so that we can actually have it one of the smartest things they did with the unicron was bringing it to new york comic-con hmm. um and putting it in that glass case because i i was there for a, you know about 15 minutes and I was just watching people like come by. They had no idea HasLab existed. They had no idea Unicron was a project. They didn't understand it. And the Hasbro rep there was like explaining it to them. And people were literally walking away like, yeah, I'm going to fund that. But, they, you know, so we can't always count on everyone to be as hooked in it, into the news stream as we are, right? Fandom is very good about knowing what's going to come. But you tell the average bear attending a convention or whatever, they have no clue, you know, Um and then I had friends who went to New York Comic Con who were on the fence and then saw it and were like, oh, OK, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to need that, <laughs> you know, in my collection. Um, but th think about the HasLab track record right now. We're three for three. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else could beat us. Like Star Wars has had failed, you know, projects. Uh, mind blowing. Right. Because I. The 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 mm, common logic used to be everything Star Wars will get bought, right? Because Star Wars fans have very deep pockets and they will just get anything you put in front of them. And the sale barge funded. So why wouldn't Ranker fund? Why wouldn't Reva's lightsaber fund? They'll just buy anything. Guess not. <laughs> you know? And look, Ghost Rider didn't fund. Yeah. Um but here we are, us Transformers guys, like, no, we're good. We're getting our space chicken. We got our we got our swordsman. We got our, you know, planet eater. And who knows what they're going to think of next. But um, I really look forward to it. And I'm so glad that we have this weird kind of not really fitting into any specific scale figure for Haslabs. Because a lot of, I think, what fans want won't fit into the classes that are at retail right now um they're really stretching the definition of leader <laughs> you know um i opened up laser prime and i was like i love the trip i love the cab <laughs> but that trailer i just i want it to be bigger i wanted to have more stuff <laughs> you know yeah. um but i understand 
why it is the way it is. Um, uh, but I think like with uh, a lot of people questioned about Motor Master being a commander, and I said to do what they want this thing to do, I don't think they had a choice. Um, I, I know I'm... that. Wait, sorry. Go. Someone's uh, talking. I'm sorry. I, th I thought the Motor Master worked really well as a commander because it, it, it yeah. did all the things I wanted it to do. And there are retool uh, opportunities there that I think are going to be delightful. Well, I think people took it out and they saw the cardboard and they were like, oh, right. Because it did look small in that big bundle of cardboard. But I was like, yeah, but you're looking at it in its most compact form. <laughs> you're not looking at it blown out into its potential. Right. Plus, you could fit the other stunicons into the rest of the yeah, box. That's true. All the spaces of the box. Shove them all in one box. Which makes sense because we're going to be getting a dinosaur box set. Yeah, which I'm looking forward to. Um, I, I'm a sucker for gift sets. I, I love gift sets. <laughs> um, but uh, I think as a fandom, we are very lucky. I think not just because of the product we're getting, but because we also have each other. If you need to look something up, if you need help with something, there is a very good chance somewhere out there is a fan who's going to help you, right? You may have to look a little, but they're out there. We have between you guys, right, uh, Chris and all these other podcasters and, and, and video casters, there is just so much information out there. Who is generating all this? It's not Hasbro. These are all fans doing this. Right. You got Sabertron, you got TFW, you got all these other websites. They're doing amazing work. Right. Keeping fans updated and stuff. And then that's not even including all the social media posts. Right. Fans like Dame Chalk, who posts on social media updates on what's coming out and everything, leaks, reveals or Unicron.com. Those guys do it a lot, too. This is the best time right now to be a fan if you want to be in the know, if you want an information stream coming at you. It has never been this good, and that is because of fans. So that's a big deal, I think. Yeah, sometimes we take that for granted, and we just assume, like, oh, there's always going to be a TF Wiki, and there's always going to be a, a, a Sabertron, and a, a, you know, TFW, and, and yada, 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 like all the various sites. There's always, Ben's always going to be posting about the new stuff on his social media platforms and then on, on his uh, website and everything. So, um, yeah, we're very lucky. And grateful. Yeah, it's it's... The stuff you guys do, the stuff other guys do, like Ryan and, and, and the other guys, it, it's hard work, even if it is their full-time job. Like, you know, Ryan, he, he runs his store, he has a site, Sabertron, that's his bread and butter. So, you know, yes, he, of course, has an economic incentive to do it, but he wouldn't be doing that if he didn't love it, right? He loves Transformers. That's why he's doing it. And um, again, we go back to the love. That's what fuels our fandom, I think. That's what our entire fandom should be propped up on. Everything after that is gravy, in my opinion. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I know we've went for quite a while. Uh, I think we're over the two-hour mark. At this Sorry point. about that. <laughs> no, no. It, it's been absolutely I, – I just don't want to monopolize your whole day. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed and I hope everyone, uh, you know, once we put this out, has enjoyed our conversation as well. Um, so I been guess great catching up. Yeah. In ages. No, this was super fun guys. I, you know, I, I'm sorry. I know I blab on a lot. I'm just, this is a topic I, was... I am enthusiastic about. It <laughs> just means we'll have to have you back again soon. <laughs> right, yes. right, there you go. For part, part two, three, four, five. Part two. Right. Happy to so, do it. Right. Yeah. No, we, we can all go all day and, you know, of course, we're uh, we're usually doing it, uh, you know, uh, weekly ourselves, uh, talking about all the various reveals and topics and, and things like that, uh, too. So, um, but yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, I guess like, is, you know, before we wrap up, like, is there anything that you want to uh, plug yourself for your various, you know, website, social media platforms and such? Sure. Uh, if you haven't been to my site, it's bwtf.com, Ben's World of Transformers. I'm also on Facebook, facebook.com slash Ben's World TF. I'm on Insta and Twitter at bwtf underscore Ben. All right. 
Well, thank you so much. And we will see everybody next week. Take care, everyone. See you guys. Thanks.